hope nobody has ever felt punk buying a Ubisoft game. Of what I consider the big three Western publishing and development houses, they are the ones I hate by far the most. In the time since I wrote that intro a year ago, that statement has gotten a lot more complicated. None of these three are free of sin, we all know that. I'm writing this as Act Blizz is facing a hopefully effective internal reckoning. Ubisoft climbs to the top of my pile on purely petty reasons. The punk alternative veneer they dress their games up in, acting like they're probing, deep and controversial, tackling questions about humanity, the nature of violence, insanity, identity, so on and so forth. They pretend to be out there and anti-establishment when they're fucking Ubisoft. These are games that want you to be comfortable and familiar while pretending to ask uncomfortable questions, and they place those questions in modular game theme parks aping different times and places. When I rewatch my earlier Watch Dogs videos, there's a lot about them that I do still stand by, but there's also an overwhelming naivete, which is rooted in the form of me ever really thinking Ubisoft were trying that these were games with messages that someone wanted conveyed and that the contradictions and internal undercutting of those ideas, well, that must have only been sloppiness or multiple writers sprawling out over each other. But now I know that it's because Ubisoft doesn't care. They don't want to take a stand. They just want to look like they're not sitting down. I called them cowards, and they are. But their cowardice is calculated. It's not failing to make a point. It's obfuscating a lack of one. It's the use of politically charged imagery to drum up marketing with someone from the company waiting in the rings, ready to dive out and say, no, don't worry, we're not saying anything. That's actually several doses of marketing. The edgy reveal, the response to it, the back down, and the incredulous response to the back down. Letting Ubisoft stay in the public eye while playing all sides. They appear edgy and controversial to the uninformed. Meanwhile, anyone who's going to bother to say anything has been preemptively ignored by the back down. You shouldn't be allowed to play people in this fashion, but by now Ubisoft's third quarter release are disavowments for the fourth. The way that Ubisoft posits ideas and explores ideologies hasn't developed since Assassin's Creed. Yes, I'm going to say even the way they present ideas is repetitive. And it worked. For a time. For Assassin's Creed. Because it was a battle between unattainable absolute freedom and slippery absolute control. You can spin that abstract conflict out for all time, and they have. It's pulpy. It's silly. You can talk in circles for years around this topic without ever needing to arrive at a point. You can make one. Just know that down the line, that point is going to be blunted. Then they spun Far Cry into this mold, and with the Jackal and Vaz, realized they just needed a new keyword per game and they could pretend their series is about something as long as they have somethings. Then came Watch Dogs, and... Oh dear. We're dealing with much closer to home problems now. These are real issues. But no worries. We're not going to change the course. The people want to be told who is good and who is bad. The Legion Tipping Point trailer apes First They Came by Martin Neimler, equivocating the apolitical private military Albion with the Nazis. An incredibly ballsy move to say the very least. As someone who has worked with game trailers in the past has given notes to VO scripts and corrected errors, there are always some truths played with, even if it's usually overplaying the importance of a gameplay feature a little. But it's on the developer or publisher end to give the go-ahead and confirm, yes, this is true. Ubisoft said this in likely the same breath they turned around and said, get Jacques ready to say this isn't true. Somehow, this didn't seem to irk anyone despite that absolutely outrageous false comparison. And someone still came out and more or less said that their game didn't actually mean anything. I wanted to say that Ubisoft should at least put their money where their mouth is. If you're going to use imagery for a quick buck, at least earn that buck. But if we're gonna do this, maybe not. Maybe don't just flippantly compare your villains to Nazis because years of World War II shooters have given you brain rot, and you just think it's an easy shorthand for generic bad guy. So yes, it annoys me. And no, I don't believe many people, if any at all, buy Ubisoft games, fooling themselves into thinking they're buying something truly edgy and out there. I think most people just want their free roam of fix, and that's okay, honestly. But there is a non-zero chance this person exists. So that's why I hope no one has ever fell for it and felt punk buying a Ubisoft game. So anyway, Watch Dogs Legion is the third entry in a series that knows what it wants to say, that being nothing, but can never settle on how it wants to look. 
From its contentious techno-noir beginnings in 2014 to a happy-go-lucky revolution in 2016, Legion merges the cynical edge of one with the neon lights of two, and moves us from an alternate modern-day America to a tyrannical future London where the populace is under the boot of the evil Albion, a private military hell-bent on imposing their deadly rule on the country. This video will have spoilers for the whole series, and maybe Liberal Crime Squad. We'll see. Ah, oh, London. What a town. We open with a little montage around London that I found more patronising than anything. For clarification, I am a Londoner, and I do like my city, and I have to remember that this is a game made jointly by Canadians and Italians with its target market being Americans. That aside, I think the choice to move to England is fairly clever. It builds on both the privacy angle owing to our proliferation of security cameras, and on the punk aesthetic of two owing to England's role in the movement's early look and sound. It's an obvious shift which presents a lot of opportunities for both story and mechanics none of which will be taken. We do have a second problem, that being who's voicing this montage. The class of cities, really. Top shelf stuff. Bagley. This is personal. I'm tired of snarky AIs. Oh, hell, I never found them funny in the first place. Smack a smarmy British voice on it and it's precision engineered to annoy me. A compliment I will give Bagley is that despite this I wound up not hating him, even though his primary purpose is as a vehicle for exposition and repetitive jokes about being a cold, dispassionate, superior AI. Did I underestimate these goons? Is there a lesson in this about humility and- Oh, no, never mind. I've traced their comms back to a remote server. I'm still amazing. Yeah, I haven't heard that one before. I wouldn't say he won me over, just that he's inoffensive and easily ignored. So Bagley reveals that we now have fully functional AI, Further technological reveals are made as he pilots this mass production drone over the hologram laden London. On the Thames, we join Agent Dalton, a member of the London DedSec. They received a tip about something going down beneath the Palace of Westminster, so our tutorial begins in Our Majesty's Secret Sewers. Sort of a middle ground between 1 and 2, taking on 1's relative linearity but allowing us to experiment a la 2. Not that there's any experimentation to be done, I can fail the stealth at least. That hurt you more than it hurt me. I don't think you get a one-liner after our performance there, Tim. It's really a reminder and refresher of already established mechanics. The first big change is that you can no longer go into a permanent wall hack. Now you pulse the environment to temporarily highlight nearby hackables and tag foes. It takes a bit more timing and actual scouting. Plus distraction as well as every other hack has been placed on long cooldowns. No more mana bars. It's now only game-breaking proportional to patience of which I have none, so this stealth does actually have some bite to it. It's immediately apparent how much less powerful we're going to be. It's down here we find a modern day gunpowder plot, and whoever's carrying it out are pinning the blame on DedSec. We make our way up into the commons where Bagley sets about disarming the bombs. We're interrupted when armed assailants storm the chamber. It's time to fight. Order! 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 Tonally, I did say this is a middle ground for the series. So unlike Watch Dogs 2, we do have to kill people, but on the bright side, they are British. Joking aside, after this tutorial it's possible for the player to not take a single life, something which is actually encouraged under the hood. It does seem to be setting up that stakes have been raised and that this is a darker story. The light-hearted antics of 2 didn't stop the hellish cyberpunk future, and DedSec can no longer afford mercy. Dalton doesn't even have non-lethal options besides objects baked into the environment and a slowly recharging mine but then the rest of the game actively penalises this approach. This could have at least been hinted at if only to help the player down the road, perhaps offering a weaker stun option and a stronger deadly option to show the actual question we're going to be faced with. DedSec realises that they've been played. As the bomb is disabled, others kick to life all over London, the headquarters is raided, and Bagley is wiped to protect other cells. Picking up a transmitter on the roof, Dalton is allured into one final trap. We're ambushed with a speech from the mysterious Zero Day. Fuck are you? Oh, you still think you're here to save London? I'm afraid that's not going to happen. You're here to help us with some important work. Important work? Killing thousands of- Exactly. To save the world. Well, I said mysterious, but really, it's the standard Ubisoft villain waffle by this point. Vague yet lofty speeches that sound meaningful because they circle around some keyword ideology and straddle a line between emotionally unhinged and coldly logical. There. That's a Ubisoft villain. It's a scrap of paper from a fortune cookie being held aloft by the writer's farts. Vars really did break the company's brain. So much so that this game has two more villains in his mould. 
Dalton is gunned down as London explodes, doing roughly 15 quid's worth of damage. What follows I actually found to be a good bit of setup that got me motivated and raring to start. Blame for the attacks is successfully pinned on DedSec. The head of Albion PMC, Nigel Cass, leverages this panic to take control, flooding London with his security forces and purging what's left of the group, along with sympathizers and eventually anyone they just deem dissident. With the government unable to stop them, they hold unchecked power so long as they keep inventing threats to combat. The tutorial ends when Sabine, the one survivor of the raid now hid out in the north, uses a spider bot to sneak into BT Tower as a news report gives us the public perception of DedSec. Now I'll be saving the start, we should have round up dead sick and thrown them in jail. Now I'll say they should all be lined up and shut. Cameo there by one of my five uncles. Can't remember which. We platform and hack our way to awakening free sleeper agents. We get to pick the first lot of the new London dead sec. So, uh, for me? Mage, ranger, fighter. Let's go. The intro is a mixed bag. It lacks the scale and set piece strength of one and the true freedom of approach of two. It gets across the changes in gameplay mechanics without priming the player for their actual weight. The cast aren't as annoying as two, but even if they were, they're mostly all dead. It's not that it's my hometown, but I am raring to take the fight into my own hands, build DedSec my way, and pick apart Albion piece by piece. This is what the end of the beginning promises, but now it's on the game to deliver. We see our operative hide from a passing patrol, something they don't actually need to do. And then we're in, free to roam London and get into scrapes. But we need a game plan, and I need to turn the permadeath on. Honestly, I'm more excited for that than reactivating Bagley. In fact, I'm not excited at all for reactivating Bagley. We're sent to a new HQ, we pop the lights on, Bagley catches up on the situation. I leave you people alone for a second and you immediately cock it all up. And a plan is formed. Rebuild the resistance, unfuck London, and find the identity of Zero Day. Legion feels like a game of two halves. There's building the Legion and liberating burrows with a string of open-ended objectives. This is the more optional side of the game that's the player's own little carved out story. And then there's... the story, where your choices in building dead tech hardly matter, and Ubisoft funnels you down a few plot lines which aren't terribly good. So let's tackle the game that way. We'll start with gameplay in the Legion system before we return to Zero. Let's begin with London. In my first impressions video, I talked about the uncanny nature of the city, and that is still very much the case. Having now spent a long time roaming it, I'll give it this. It's a fascinating compression. A lot of the smaller details are right, but also slightly wrong. For my example, we'll be taking the area around Angel Station, Upper Street. Since it's about my area, I know it well, no one was buying this game to see virtual Upper Street, so this seems like a fair baseline. The general shape of the surrounding area is admirable, but sort of jarring. The way it threads into Camden Passage threw me when I tried to follow real-world directions, but it is there, and this steep does actually exist. The facade of this restaurant is correct, but what it is is not. They for some reason move the burger joint one stop over. I'm impressed that they got Islington Green, but then the shopping high street across from it is now houses for some reason? And that's Watch Dogs London all over. Incredibly granular details that are roughly correct, but sort of jumbled. Like a song played in perfect rhythm but off-key. It leads to an experience where I can look one side of the street, know where I am and feel like I can navigate on my own memory, but never will because I turn around and nope, no, nah, no, nope, it's all gone. I've had fascinating moments with the in-game pubs where the interiors are correct to the pub that would be about that spot, and they're littered in amongst more generic fare. This is the one place in Legion that's actually smaller in real life. And I do love how busy the city feels. The game does do a good surface level job mixing the feeling of a historical city with encroaching change. As drones fly above traffic, clearly sporting electric engines, PMC forces harass the population and I can take a propaganda at some propaganda. And hey, for all the evil they've done, Albion did at least catch some pedophiles. Good on them. It's also gorgeous. I don't usually talk about graphics settings, but DLSS is some miracle tech and I am enamoured with ray tracing, a method producing real-time reflections by tracing every source of light in the environment and how it reacts with different surfaces. At night and in the rain, and on a rainy night, the city is gorgeous. If I'll give Ubisoft any credit, their open worlds, while lacking in substance, are actually very nice to soak in. And now that soak is contributing. 
Ray tracing rarely contributes to the gameplay. Being able to check my six or look around corners using reflections only occasionally popped up, but it's in those moments I felt an appreciation for what ray tracing might mean in actual interaction. The tech is new to video games and is more or less a fancy gimmick. The only people who have access to it have high-end graphics cards and new consoles. But I am curious if and when designers are going to run into opportunities or issues created when the player can leverage reflections to their advantage. The video game mirror coming and going has been a joke for a while, but now the whole world can have some of that sheen. Overall, it's a decent recreation to wander around, it's lively, and it's playing with some cutting edge stuff, both in the game itself and outside. But this isn't London. It looks like London. The cars drive on the easy joke side of the road. It has the tube, but unlike Chicago, we can't actually ride the train, so have to take the L on that one. It has the buses, the black cabs, and, well, you'll never see a Mini like this these days, but to an outsider, this looks like London. But it isn't. I say that from a gameplay perspective. The game doesn't really leverage being set in England to change much of anything. In the wake of Watch Dogs 2, rumours did spread of a sequel that would omit gun combat. Born from a group of people hoping Ubisoft would take that route after positive reception to Marcus and his game's expansion of trickery, non-lethal options, and lighter tone. I didn't personally want that, and frankly, I didn't think it would happen. Just because a feature is omitted doesn't mean another will necessarily get better. And Ubisoft wouldn't dare because it might look like it makes a point about guns, which might turn off a potential buyer. These games need to sell, and they're sold on freedom of approach. This is still fundamentally watchdogs. Go to a place, do an objective in a way you see fit, get out. Moving to London, however, does present an opportunity to skew the balance of weapons, perhaps making guns rarer and thus making packing provocateurs more practical and valuable, lowering the amount of armed combat or possibility for the player to carry it out, but making it more impactful. Instead, everyone is loaded like it's Lambeth. Most people you scan will have a piece, and joining Deadsec comes with a free gun, so we better talk about them. I miss when a headshot was a headshot, and I miss a lot. The big ticket feature of Legion is that everyone is playable. Anyone can be made to join DeadSec. I can't say if this is the reason why everyone is now packing a health bar. Perhaps Ubisoft just thinks people in England are this hardy. Or maybe it's because some of those people have a dart gun that can one-shot, and well, we can't make that not feel special. But what's immediately obvious is that the gameplay of Legion is going to be bogged down by multiple interlocking systems, creating skewed priorities. Watch Dogs 1 and 2 aren't exceptional third-person shooters by any means, but featured solid fundamentals. They had immediacy, animated smoothly, and controlled well. There was at least a feeling of flow if you played in a mobile way and used hacks, and while the odds were stacked against you, a quick wit and good aim would even the playing field. While I will praise hacks moving from mana to cooldown for the stealth, this winds up making already trickier combat even more punitive. Add on that enemies will instantly recover if they're attacked while disabled, and you've got a stodgy player antagonistic mess, which has downplayed the series' former key selling point and created a more rote shooter than was already there in service of the new one. I'm playing this game with permadeath on. I can lose recruits, so I'm taking a risk any time I enter a gunfight with them. We are playing as under watchdogs. So I expected a little unfairness I need to play cleverly to overcome. I know direct engagement is the last resort of a guerrilla war, and I respect that the combat is tuned to bolster that message. Enemies coming in greater numbers and having limitless reinforcements? Understandable. That plus all of them being at times unflinchable bullet sponges while I'm tissue paper? Perhaps a bit much. The weapons just lack any punch. You have to whittle everyone down. You're given little room to breathe, and even if a shot is on target, popping out of cover itself feels punished when I have to expose myself for a prolonged period to actually put anyone down. I love the idea behind this and hate the result. Getting out of situations alive felt like a feat, and the fact that a life was on the line does heighten that somewhat. But the combat moment to moment is no longer punchy or satisfying. The only new dynamic decision making I stumbled upon was realizing that full damage didn't actually kill me. So if the chips were down, I'd literally drop out, which only served to make the whole thing ridiculous. Cool looking and dynamic moments could rear their head, but it's a tightrope of the controls coming together and the rare instances where a headshot would do as a headshot does. There does appear to be a baked in mercy where sometimes when your near death enemies are programmed to start whiffing shots and give you a window to make a move, which does create some tense do or die moments. But for the most part, it's stodgy and frustrating. So you may say, Snake, just use stealth like the game says. If combat is this punitive, it's clearly meant to be something you only do as a last resort. Would that I could. We'll come back to that.
I should also mention, if it wasn't clear, that I am playing the game on its hardest difficulty. There is a gulf where normal is a cakewalk which annihilates the intended tone, while hard is a death march. And I prefer the spice over the fondant. That was a fucking abysmal food metaphor, but so's the shooting, so let's go with it. For all of my myriad frustrations with the upper difficulties, I find the games to be a lot more engaging when played on them. It feeds into the permadeath cycle, makes daring capers that bit more daring, and pushes you into actually having to use your expanded tool set, not to flex on enemies, but as a matter of life and death, stealing every advantage. I also said it animates some controls worse, and that brings us to a new addition. Let's not call it a gameplay feature. Let's call it what it is. A shunt. I love my scrappy street brawling. Putting it in a game is an easy way to win a few points with me. I'd buy a Sesame Street game if I could go Camarocho on the Cookie Monster. So it brings me no pleasure to say that Legion's brawling is a rigid, context-based nightmare, which is not only dull in and of itself, but drags the entire game down around it. You've got an attack, a guard break, and a dodge. You attack, if they block, break it. When they swing, dodge it. Then you can do a heavily damaging counter hit. Fighting groups of foes just means you have to dodge more often. It's so stubbornly context based that battles do not meaningfully scale in any way. A one on one is very similar to a one on eight. There is zero thought, strategy, or improvisation to it. The only interesting aspect of it is how it can escalate to a gunfight. When spotted, enemies will engage you in fisticuffs and won't call for backup. So you're encouraged to try and take an enemy out before anyone else stumbles into the scrap. I found the most engaging dust-ups I had were when I was trying to manage my opponent while staying out of sight of further enemies, which is a unique juggling act. But randomly an enemy will go and draw their gun, and if they shoot, that's the green light for code red so render them black and blue and do it fast. It's a system where it's safest to play defensive, dodge attacks and counter, but you're encouraged to get aggressive and deal with foes quick. There's a potentially great tension in these mechanics, but it doesn't work, since the player has at best tenuous control over the pace of a fight. If I saw an enemy go for their gun, I'd sometimes just give up and hope I get KO'd before I get killed. Certain gadgets do help with this, but you're giving up more broadly useful tools for something that's best used as a fallback option in an edge case scenario. The whole system is a big boring ball of contradictions. But the real problem isn't the combat itself, it's how it's affected everything else. I'm certain many of this game's control issues begin here. When you enter melee combat, the whole system has to change to accommodate it. The way the player moves shifts into a sticky proximity based lock on and all the button mappings get overwritten with new actions. The moment to moment gameplay is now segregated in a way that is not well accommodated and it jeopardized me more than a few times. In this instance, killing my character when the button to disable a turret was now firmly overwritten by punching. Doubly infuriating since I'm on PC where that command is also bound to the mouse. So the turret went off, everyone escalated, and now David is dead. At times the ability to drop on enemies gets confused if the game doesn't quite know what state we're in, and certain gadgets, even ones that could be useful, require wriggling free of the fight's catchment area to use them. There are further issues with contextual controls. Gun takedowns are now limited to specialized operatives, but triggering these attacks is context-based and shares a button with a flimsy butt stroke which every operative possesses. Depending on range, position, phase of the moon, it will pick between the thing you want to do and that bloody butt stroke. An attack which fails most of the time and enemies recover from faster than you do. On higher difficulties, this sort of imprecision is simply unacceptable for how lethal the game can be. The dodge roll ability is also a massive hindrance since it shares input with the button to scale objects. So they have to fight for control and the game has a hard time picking a winner. Legion is, for the most part, a simple game. The melee system understandably tries to follow suit, but only winds up knocking everything else off balance, and in and of itself isn't very engaging outside of its memes as a stopgap where it falls apart anyway because its core tension isn't in tune with its rhythm. Another new addition are drones and turrets. My problems with the gameplay aside, I do appreciate what these bring to the table. Each type of drone pressures the player in a unique way in both combat and stealth, expanding the scope of gameplay and creating new problems to overcome. With certain upgrades or perks, they can be temporarily disabled, turned on enemies, or directly commandeered. All of these hacks have trade-offs and provide different benefits. Disabling a drone takes it out of commission, but it also means you can't turn it against others until it's back on. Do you switch off turrets to make stealth easier? 
or keep them active in case things get hot and you need their firepower. Drones are great for scouting, but there's no risk of alarming the enemy when you use the CCTV system. This is how you expand the scope of gameplay for a series like Watch Dogs. You layer options on top of what was already there and weigh up their strengths and weaknesses. Then there's the cargo drone, the next evolution of four can scissor lifts. Funny thing is, Legion still has them, but there's about two or three secreted over London, hidden like ancient relics. The cargo drones obsolete these things completely and are omnipresent. There's no balancing around prior elements, just utter obliteration. I like the drones, honestly, but it's also the figurative and literal height of Ubisoft's open world sins. I feel bad for the level designers who spent time working out angles, flanks, possible routes a player might take to get into or scale on top of a zone. All invalidated in the name of player choice, meaning some cheeky fuck added the fly tool to the player's arsenal. And it sticks out like a sore thumb. It should be obvious by now, but the player's ability to hack has been massively nerfed. It's much more limited. Mass hacks are now a trait possessed very rarely by certain people. Plus, some of the more busted hacks like Gang Hit and APB are gone. If you want to get the factions fighting, you have to do it the old-fashioned way. I get the intent to make this a grittier, more desperate game, where you have to actually turn up and do things. Make victories more hard-won and deadly force less encouraged. Sneaking in and out of a place and getting away with something outrageous is much more rewarding when you know you're on a knife's edge. I like the idea of the rebalancing, but the result leaves a lot to be desired and only mires the gameplay and complications that it can't iron out. It sucks the fun out hoping the tension will create a new fun, but it simply isn't there. Year on year, one journalist or another feels the need to point out the Ubisoft formula. But it's not a formula, not anymore, hasn't been for a few years. It's a toy box. Each game will pick and choose a few toys to throw in, with one new big ticket toy to spin some of the marketing around. Then that feature goes into the box to maybe be pulled out as a little side thing in the coming years. It changes just enough that the next year another journalist will finally have the same disillusionment. It changes just enough to keep the discourse just as repetitive as they are. Let's finally talk about the key selling point. The ability to recruit and play as anyone. Lads and ladies, geezers and guards, pedestrians on the streets, dead sec in the sheets. Why'd I go over the broad strokes gameplay before talking about it? Well, because at best it doesn't matter. It's a fun idea. There is a honeymoon period where it's fun to wander around looking for interesting recruits. A wedding planner with a shotgun? Hilarious. A philosopher with an MP5 who's been running a one-man war against Clan Kelly? Fuck Kant, the only philosopher he needs are Heckler and Koch. A guy who shares the name of a paranoid Irishman from a tabletop game I played in? So you're a dead sec. Or maybe that's just what the order wants me to think. It's a fucking conspiracy. And I will say, this is an inspired evolution of the profiler. Part of the setting presence since the first game, made to demonstrate how badly our data has been compromised and interactively make a point about the setting has been turned into a... player beneficial feature. All's fair in love and info wars, I guess. Okay, here's some personal reflection. During Watch Dogs 1, I went against people saying how the profiler made NPCs feel more alive because to me it had the opposite effect. I now think we were both wrong. Them being dehumanized by being reduced to a few key data points <laughs> is actually the point. It wasn't a negative. This shows how companies will strip you down to your exploitable, marketable features. And now, look at Legion. I'm shopping. London has been turned into the biggest, clunkiest character select screen of all time. And then you realize this menu does the navigation for you. The hunt is undercut when you realize specialist recruits who will actually have the more wild traits will be flagged up so you can't miss them. So why am I even bothering with the riffraff? The suite of NPCs with their own voices, stances, walk cycles, and attack animations very quickly lose their sheen as their awkward, uncanny dialogue comes to the fore. I'm sure I got filmed in there. What if they go looking through the tapes? What if they already did? You gotta get your hands on that evidence first. You just gotta. I'll owe you big. Okay, we'll help you solve this problem. The fact the game's script has been recorded in full by roughly 20 actors is impressive when you know that fact. But more work doesn't automatically mean a more praiseworthy result beyond the effort spent. The acting is incredibly stilted, a result of there being no possible back and forth since they have no idea which of 20 accents they'll be responding to. 
The City of London really only possesses two characters, those within DedSec and those without. As someone gets assimilated, their personality becomes a vaguely cheeky, cocky, optimistic mush to fit the narrative. You know, statistically speaking, smoking is more likely to kill you than any DedSec op. Statistic or whatever! My chance of dying's 100%, so who gives a fuck? And what's funny is that at times, this still falls apart. We are working with the fucking cup now. Let's all sign our death warrants. Stupid. I know it sounds insane, but it could be insane enough to work. Lao isn't your typical cop. Not typical, uh-huh. Why didn't I believe that? You're acting like she's some Albion goon. Give her a chance. She might, you know, surprise you. Sure. And when she stabs you in the back, I guess you'll be surprised too. I'd say look who's talking, but nobody is. Still, occasionally you'll find an ability someone possesses that seems different and interesting, something which may expand the gameplay and create a worthwhile unit. Though in reality, most of these unique abilities either have niche functionality, or are just slightly stronger versions of ones that you can unlock for everybody. Who boy, shock hacks? So this person has three generic enemy stuns instead of two? When they talk to civilians. I swear, the ability to neck a pint to increase melee damage just doesn't work. Maybe because that's clearly not a pint. The underwhelming tech upgrades do less to expand your options and more to fill in gaps that recruits may possess, raising the floor of how useful they might be by making more and more traits redundant. Early on, a unit with the drone betrayal trait presents a unique opportunity. A few upgrades later and that trait is pointless. About the only thing that remains above what tech can really give you are lethal weapons, since all dead sex supplies are underpowered stun variants. So, thanks Legion for at least trying to vindicate a point I made during the first video about bringing appropriate gear for a job. I didn't realise I'd be bringing a whole person along with it because they refused to share. The longer I'm exposed to it, it becomes clear that this key selling point is actually a chain around the game's leg, which a more tedious, rote feature works to cement over. Here's how recruitment works. Come on, calm down, calm down. You walk up to someone and ask them to join. They'll give you a random task or two to complete, and they're in. If they dislike DedSec, you'll need to use a deep profiler on them first to do another task which will make them more agreeable. Yeah, you invade their privacy and offer your unsolicited, potentially deadly services, and that works. Thank fuck. Wow, a Ubisoft game's gameplay undercutting the central theme of the series? You don't say. Legion sees the return of a karma meter, now in the form of reputation and relations. And surprisingly, I really like this system. It's not a binary metric, but a sort of simulated ripple effect. If you KO or kill somebody, they're never really going to get on with DedSec. And neither will people close to them. NPCs aren't generated alone. They come with friends, family, and associates, and your actions and alliances echo outwards. This is another encouragement for stealth, but, well, still going to get to that. The less pain you put out into the world, the less is reflected back, making recruitment easier. The Albion troops harassing civilians create fun opportunities as stepping in to rescue people is an easy way to boost a negative opinion while risking a chase. The game has also accounted for a free roaming staple in a really clever way. Since you'll likely be nicking a lot of cars, how do you allow a player to do this without them racking up a PR nightmare? Well, there are now self-driving cars out on the road which are free to take. This is great. It's a progression of technology which is topical and in line with the series, a natural fit for the new karma system, and it's honestly the funniest joke in the game. A subtle speculative what if at what may happen to a self-driving car when it's ferrying itself somewhere, and it's about as insightful as Legion ever really gets. That all said, you can nick any car you want. Want to know how? Hacking a vehicle will wiggle its driver out, at which point they'll forget all about their connection to it. This is what happens in incredibly systems-driven games. The AI becomes highly exploitable and daft unless you account for every possibility, which is a nightmare of scope. Want to know the easiest way to nick an objective vehicle? Simply move it outside its restricted zone since the guards don't actually have any relation to it. They're only tethered to their space. While we're here, the simplicity of Chase AI also has to be highlighted. I hypothesized in the last game that when an out-of-sight player takes corners, the AI flips a coin on whether it will make a correct guess. Now, they don't even get that far. 
It's a bit of a shame. It meant I never got to see if escape abilities actually work. Round a corner or two and you're as good as gone. The tight streets of London are simply too complicated for this AI. Suspect is unsighted. Unsighted sweeping area. Going back to reputation, there are also broad negative and positive modifiers that NPCs will possess. So even if you haven't harmed anyone directly related to them, word of mouth might make people cagey about dead sex collateral damage. What's funny to me is that this game possesses so few positive actions that what they've had to come up with to make people like you is hilariously flat. Dead sec kills, dead sec crashes a lot of cars, dead sec siphons cash. Look at me, I'm stealing a boat. But they had a pint in our local. That's more or less it. Scattered around the city are pubs you can neck a pint in, which will add a random chance for people near the pub to like you. If the IRA darkened my locals' doors, I would not look on them more favourably. Especially since the pub would be gone the next day. The only other positive modifier I found was that using a tranquilizer gun is somehow seen as a positive. They're really stretched for ideas here. Let's quickly touch on the game's currencies. Scattered around the world are tech points, and the money is now a form of cryptocurrency called Ito. Tech points obviously upgrade your tech, and due to the structure of the game, I often found myself thinking that, well, if I can get to the tech points, do I even need them? Especially since every environment will likely be revisited in a proc gen recruitment mission. Is me going and scooping them up in my free time just creating repetition for later and cementing their redundancy? These are the sort of dull thoughts Legion often creates. And all the money now does is purchase clothes and cosmetics. DeadSec traded in their 3D printer for a spinning jenny. But why can't Ito be put to other uses? While I shouldn't encourage grind, perhaps it could be spent in and around the world, donated to causes to raise positive perception of DeadSec, maybe used as a quick means to make NPCs' position towards DeadSec improve, or as a means to buy your way out of negative reputation modifiers. I'm not saying donating to charity offsets murder, just that effort in gameplay and expending resources should cut both ways and make the player feel more involved with their own standing in the world. There's no imagination or forward thought when it comes to crypto being here, just Ubisoft taking a new thing at face value. I don't know why I expect that when they clearly think speculative fiction means the writer was wearing glasses, but all Ito is is a replacement for the pound symbol. Come on, try. Try anything. Look forward a little bit. This all said, I do still think the reputation is the most well put together and interesting part of Legion. It's more organic than a black and white bar, and on some level did have me weighing up my actions and approaches. Even if I did still kill a lot of people. And what is there to do about London besides end lives and gather tech? Well, precious little. It's a bit better than two in variety, but far worse in execution. We, um, we got a darts minigame and, oh, oh my god. That's a football. Is there football? Oh hell yeah, let's go play. Keepy uppy. I am so fucking disappointed. I saw that football icon and I thought, yeah, five aside. Dead sec FC, baby, let's go. Then I turn up and I get a QTE survival mode. No thank you. I've got better things to do than kick a ball. We got bare knuckle league. What's pathetic about this is that there's graffiti outside Dead Sec HQ. But if you ignore it, the game will lose confidence and just tell you about the side quest when you get within a few miles of one of the five tournaments. It's five rounds of the game's utterly tedious melee combat. What's actually interesting is the reward it grants. Clearing a tournament gives you a roster of talented fighters to track down and recruit. Issue is, they're only melee fighters, one of the least useful recruit types, but that's still fascinating, right? This is the only activity that cleverly ties its rewards into the Legion system, that being talented recruits. Going from this and getting a little imaginative, there should have been more games like this. Paintball tournaments for hitmen, drone races for drone experts, regular races for getaway drivers, stealth challenges for spies and wire puzzles for hackers. Oh, oh god, the wire puzzles. I've redrafted this script several times and forgot until the end to even mention wire puzzles. They're not even puzzles at this point. It'd be like me saying that untangling cables counts as a mind tickler, since that's all they are now. They are bundled up cables that you take the time to write. There's no puzzle to them. And they are, once again, mapped to the environment and often spread over an annoyingly wide distance. These just stick around, but they only get less and less fun and just feel more rote and perfunctory. Legion, you don't need them. You can get rid of them. You clearly don't enjoy making them anymore. 
So anyway, that's it. There's very little to do in London. Pre-existent minigames are gone or used as a one-off objective. There is exactly one checkpoint race in the game. And I'm almost fucking insulted by Keepy Uppy. That's the best you can think of. That's England to ya. I'm not even a patriotic guy, but fuck off Ubisoft. Just fuck off. Don't darken my country's doors again. Now we come to what is perhaps the biggest issue. Since every ability, upgrade, and trait is optional, the mission areas have been designed to be approachable, not just for a recruit with nothing, but a recruit with a busted hip. Then, due to the proc-gen nature of recruitment missions and the open-endedness of borough liberation tasks, a singular space needs to facilitate multiple objective types. Compounding both of these problems is that Ubisoft still wants to accommodate multiple playstyles. What this means is that no two areas are actually that distinct, and your choice of operative doesn't matter. If you didn't equip a spider bot, there'll be a dispenser. If you need a cargo drone, there'll be a summon down the road. If your operative even lacks the ability to scale walls, there'll be an open back door. If you don't need any of these, well, they'll still be there for your leisure. The only actual difference is that bringing an appropriately employed operative into certain zones allows for new social stealth. This is slower paced and more predictive than reactive, as you have to maintain an appropriate distance where they can't smell the dead sec off you, a mix of sativa and burnt metal. The issue is that it's just not very interesting. I don't feel like the extra work hiring Albion contractors or Clan Kelly goons has really given me any behind the scenes access so much as new ways to do the same thing slower and with less gameplay. So on the one hand, who you play doesn't matter. But on the other, it absolutely sodding does. If you're not playing with the biggest, loudest gun possible, you may already be dead. Security's onto you. They're sending some goons your way. You won't be told this until it's too late, but occasionally objectives will result in a base-wide alert, everyone already set to deadly force, reinforcements called, and operative culled. This is why stealth doesn't matter. Sometimes a gunfight is non-negotiable. This is why a body count of some type will be piled up. Enemies incoming. Oh, that's fair. So, the one way Ubisoft does push towards actually picking your operative, and it's to make me paranoid for the rest of the game, that if I don't have an assault rifle on hand, I'm a dead man walking. Yeehaw! In case you're wondering, the most powerful operatives in my experience turned out to be the Hitman and the DJ. The Hitman has more guns, and the DJ has an ability that boosts your damage and significantly speeds up cooldowns, along with a massive area stun. He also spawned with an ability where his health would replenish with every kill. Thank you, Dante, or whatever your name was, for carrying me over the finish line. If you saw my first impressions video, you're probably wondering, where's Boris? Well, I'm sad to say, he's retired. This video took me a year because this game took me three attempts and two patched in difficulties to actually finish it. Resistance difficulty doesn't save Legion, but it puts it closer to what it should be. For starters, Albion personnel and drones now know DedSec operatives on site. Congratulations, a patch made the opening make sense. Combine this with the security checkpoints being always hostile, which before only tagged you if you were currently wanted, and roaming London is now a lot more tense moment to moment. Now I actually feel victim to a security state. Tech points might now be trapped, and taking them summons an Albion response. This is a good idea. Also adds to the cat and mouse dynamic of the game, but is quite poorly implemented. As I said, most chases end when you round a corner. These cops will be spawned around the corner. It's an empty threat, especially when rigged collectibles are placed in spots Albion is never meant to access. Combat is made a lot more dangerous. Legion does have elite enemies with unique abilities and counter gadgets. These are meant to be fed in over the course of the campaign, but resistance mode drops them in from the start and ups the speed at which reinforcements are called. I like these enemies a lot. They make things a lot more dynamic, and the series was already long overdue to place enemies who can counter your own abilities. Hack cooldowns have been made longer, ammo pools smaller, you can no longer rig traps to detonate automatically, and the spider drone's takedown ability has been disabled. I'm not fond of all of these changes, and not all of them actually quite work with the campaign, but we'll get to that. One feature that does backfire hilariously are the changes to quick travel. Resistance mode disables the tube. A patch implemented map-based operative swapping, where at any time you can see where your people are around London and hop over to them. On paper, this is good. It makes every recruit more valuable, even if it's just as a warp point, and at least pretends that DedSec is active. Here's where it falls down. 
Let's say I'm headed to a mission, and someone else is closer. I'll jump to them. Then, because the game wants to make people look busy, that first recruit I just swapped off of will likely jump right outside the mission to scout it. I used poor Laura here as an in-between three times in a row. Bagley just kept teasing her. Second issue. You can then do a regular operative swap to change your player character while remaining totally in place. The intent of this was to encourage using different operatives, seeing what hand you're dealt when someone is close to a mission and maybe you feel that trekking across the city is a bit too difficult or dull. But they overlook the original feature which totally undermines it. In an attempt to make travel more restrictive, they did the opposite. Regardless, I find Resistance Mode to be a slightly better version of the game, but I wish some of its features were not locked alongside above hard mode damage that can just lead to instant death at times. Legion is already spongy as hell, and I'm not just referring to enemies here. Give people a modular difficulty select. The changes to police and checkpoints are fantastic tonal additions, and the price for that extra atmosphere shouldn't be punishment for people who don't want it. I would still take the whole thing because I'm weird and stubborn and I think the game is improved as a whole by it, but I know not everyone's going to feel that way. The titular feature, core hook, and main selling point of this game is a bust. What should be a central conceit which deepens play and decision making instead doles out what the previous games offered, but does it piecemeal. I'm going to now run the game through a knowingly brutal set of comparisons. I very much enjoy games where you put teams together. Building armies, collecting allies, and putting those forces to use is an easy way to get my attention, and I've played my share of these games, both open-ended sandboxes and more structured experiences. This isn't totally unfair. Ubisoft is a large company that likely had the means to actually add depth to their back-of-the-box feature, but lacked the care to give the team the time or resources to actually do that. We'll start with what is the most just comparison. Ubisoft themselves. Syndicate is the last of the old Assassin's Creed games. Much like Legion, it's a London-based free roamer with an overtouted and underutilized gang mechanic. Instead of randomized characters collected in the course of play, the player spends resources and clears missions to fill burrows with generic allies that can be recruited as followers. Despite the relative simplicity and how it matters even less to the ongoing narrative, this aspect alone makes it far more engaging than Legion. In Legion, we never feel like a Legion. We're demons hopping bodies. Everybody else is about as meaningful as an extra life. What's the point in having an army if we can't mobilize as one? Well, an answer to that is sort of present in the game. The hooligan, the protester, and the magician have abilities which create temporary allies. Their AI is abysmal, and I'm talking by their own game standards. They are south of the Thames stupid. You would never risk real operatives who took minutes to recruit knowing that they would die in seconds. I say forgetting that permadeath is optional. A more pompous part of me would argue, why not just make the AI better? You know, as if it's so simple. This is a game where an enemy patrol once jumped off of a skyscraper to investigate a noise they heard below. It cuts both ways. This leads into a second internal comparison. Ubisoft just wasn't looking hard enough in their toy box. If we can't trust followers to handle themselves, then the problem is a lack of means to direct them. But that functionality is written into Watch Dogs DNA. The first game's camera missions where you attempted to guide others out of danger in an RTS style. This could have been expanded, turning Legion into a light squad tactics game and actually leveraging the core mechanic for meaningfully different play. Allowing maybe drone expert characters, maybe commanders, or hell, just anyone if it doesn't need to be a specific character trait, to lead others in stealth operations and assault. Perhaps fighting alongside them or allowing for a pause feature for greater control. I repeat, why bother having a Legion mechanic if you will never use it for anything requiring multiple people? Legion does take a page from GTA V's book. When jumping to an operative, you'll get a small peek into their life, somewhat randomized by voice, making them seem distinct. I repeatedly found Josh here pissing in public. I'm not sure why, it's not like he was drinking much. Also, there was always another DedSec bloke watching nearby. Not sure why. The point is, Ubisoft had an eye on GTA V and their heads in the ground. Watchdogs should have been picking from GTA V's heist and Mass Effect 2's suicide mission. Before you enter a joint, you click on that building on the map, and this would open a menu where you assign tasks to agents. 
Let's create a made-up scenario. Imagine you're breaking into an Albion facility and you could pick a person to put on distraction duty, with their traits deciding the method and perhaps offering different perks. If you pick a getaway driver, they'll lift an Albion vehicle and speed off, drawing away some of the guards. Or conversely, they could sit outside and offer a getaway. A protest leader drums up a crowd so that if an alert triggers, things get rowdy outside. A hitman snipes from across the street, just like Geordie in that one mission from the first game. Perhaps things like this could make the infiltration easier while adding a timer or percentage risk of losing agents you have giving you backup. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Perhaps an insider could reveal enemy locations. Hackers could double your hacks before cooldowns or speed those cooldowns up. A drone expert could send in a chase drone to follow you over the shoulder and provide cover fire or conceal you from enemy drones, halving the potential number of obstacles during stealth. At the very least, I feel that certain traits should very well double as passive tag team abilities, expanding the moveset and letting us pretend that we're a collective force. Depending on who you are, this one is either going to be the most meaningful or just utterly pointless. I can't bring myself to care about any of my recruits all that much. I mean, if at all. Sure, I ran into a few I found amusing. You can play them up and have a laugh like I did with Boris. And I occasionally felt a pang of something when one of my guys died, but that was mostly in the feeling that a streak had ended. I felt upset in the same way I do when I drop a Tony Hawk combo. Not in the way a game like XCOM makes a loss feel. In Legion, I have no attachment to characters beyond their utility, mostly the gun they brought. When I remember XCOM campaigns, I remember the scrapes soldiers got out of, the poor odds they survived, and the days they saved. I didn't even pick these people. They were brought to me and their stories got carved out through choices I made and the dice that we rolled together. I actually put this attachment down to disattachment. In XCOM, you are guiding your soldiers, but you're not making the shot for them. On some level, they are distinct from my influence. And that distance makes all the difference. When a soldier lands a tricky shot, hell yeah, go them. When I miss a shot in Legion, I missed. At the end of the day, these people don't have tails. They are tools. And yes, because XCOM soldiers mechanically advance, that does also add to my feeling of loss as a commander. I now have to rethink battle plans and team lineups. There's a hole that has to be plugged. And a hole in my heart that never will be. Looking at old Legion trailers, it seems that at some point leveling agents was on the cards. Though with the structure of the game as it is now, I can imagine several reasons this didn't make it to final release. Legion just doesn't have the length and breadth of content to make leveling up all that many agents worthwhile or meaningful. There is undeniably fluff content in the game, unending 404 contracts for one, but no sane person would grind these same two missions over and over. One of them is literally just ferrying a drone two blocks with no time limit or danger, it's pathetic. But maybe this is a hint at the kind of other proc gen content we may have been spared, which would have existed just to grind out agent stats. Perhaps Ubisoft did actually decide to trim this fat. Also keep in mind, Legion wants you playing as multiple people, so why create grind and mechanical incentive to create your perfect unit? The older starting bonuses look blandly percentile based, and then you unlock and choose interesting perks, rather than the actual traits people possess in the final game, which makes them more interesting to pick up from the get-go. I know I wouldn't bother recruiting all that much if all I saw browsing people on the street was plus 10% damage, plus 50% cockney, 200% down to clown. Though the unlock perks look way more fun than anything we got and seem to actually add nuance and tie into the tech upgrade, so I'm kind of sad we had to see them go. And the last reason is good old fashioned scope and feature creep. Perhaps finding the gameplay justification, fun, and incentive in playtesting for this leveling system was proving tricky, so they simplified and focused on the human collectathon nature. I do still think it's a shame. The game shown in Legion's trailer likely doesn't exist and only implies a more interesting time, but man, I kind of wish we had that. Let me justify this section a little. Section 3 was me breaking down and pulling the gameplay apart for what it was. This case study is me imagining a better game. I know the stuff I'm saying I wish was here would just take a whole new one. So now that I've addressed anyone who thinks I've gone off my nut, let's talk about an ASCII game that kicks Legion shit in. Liberal Crime Squad, or LCS, is a 2002 roguelike developed by Tarn Adams, best known for Dwarf Fortress. It's a comedic romp where the player builds a movement to install a liberal government in the US by any means necessary, and it's one of the best gang management games I've ever played. I would never expect a full 3D game to simulate the wealth of options that LCS has, 
but there are still lessons that could be learned. Recruiting is a complex process with multiple approaches. People with deathly opposed views need to be swayed. One way to do this is not approach them politically, but, say, romantically. Manipulating and tricking them into the fold that, okay, maybe, maybe you sort of shouldn't do that bit, however familiar they may be with being abusive, and that isn't even the worst form of recruitment. Let's cut the creepy part and get to the point. There are multiple paths to acquiring people. Some won't change unless the world changes around them. You have to appeal to and win loyalty. Despite being a gag game that's taking the piss out of both sides, it still presents this process in a more believable and interesting way. People also have a lot more flexibility and utility once they are units. They don't even have to become active members of the squad, but can instead be planted as sleeper agents. These have relatively limited options, but offer unique benefits. Removing the fog of war in their places of work and residence, opening locked doors, helping you out of a legal jam. The closest Legion gets is that barristers and medics reduce your respawn timer when a member of DedSec has a whoopsie. That's as far as passive team benefits go, unless you're a fashionista. Even mechanically weak people in LCS have a purpose. The relatively unskilled are much easier to recruit, and in good number can be put to work in a multitude of ways, either creating positive buzz, cash flow, or a last resort combat squad, easily acquired and cheaply outfitted. Different people with different jobs present genuinely different opportunities for the player, opening up avenues that would be very tricky to go down without. In Liberal Crime Squad, you're often running a war on multiple fronts, winning the hearts of the people, keeping the money coming in to fund operations, finding secrets and taking out key targets, reducing your heat and keeping an eye on your enemies. Legion crawls where LCS sprints, and it does this while letting the player forge their own path and set their own goals. Legion cannot hope to match the complexity of this, but what I hate is that it doesn't even scratch the surface. There's no ingenuity, no true player expression, no creativity in how the player takes back the city, except for the creativity that has been prescribed. Everyone you get, no matter how eclectic, is funneled down exactly the same path. In Liberal Crime Squad, convincing artists to help you gives you an effective means to create a low-paying but safe and legal way to win hearts. If you put, say, a lab tech to work doing paintings, well, it's going to be a very long time before they're even passable at it. In Legion, paste-ups exist around the city and they can be done by anyone. You don't even need an artist. All they have is a remodeled stun gun and grenade, not a unique skill that they bring to the cause. LCS benefits from not having a set-in-stone story. The only tale told in any run is that of your struggle. Armed revolution? Information campaign? An army of drug dealers and prostitutes answering to a mysterious overlord? Or do you just buy a printing press then mash W to take the dub? It's not perfect. See, the Borough Liberation objectives which lead into a drone-based one-off mission which free a region from control, this is the player's story. Their tale of how they freed London, shut down the checkpoints and turned the people on Albion. Congratulations! You did it! It's easier to recruit around here now and you get a free recruit with good traits. Those one-off drone missions are fun, don't get me wrong, they are inventive. A high-speed hit-and-run job with a modified chase drone, a platforming section through Big Ben's mechanisms, having to navigate a pitch-dark room by manipulating a drone's light. These are actually sort of entertaining. But it's dodging the question of who you're actually playing as. It's cutting you off right at the climax, taking that ownership away from you. This is the player's story. And it doesn't end with a bang. It doesn't end with a groan. It doesn't even end with you. It just ends uncommented on, because it would on some level contradict the yarn that Ubisoft has spun for us. Even when all of London is technically liberated, it doesn't matter. It just means you get to shut the fuck up now. Player-influenced emergent play isn't impossible to get to work alongside a hard-set story that's meant to have characters and narrative arcs and themes. I mean, even LCS in all of its goofiness has readable messages. After all, it's a political satire. It's just one that has a really fun gang management aspect to it that I want something else to pick up and run with, politically oriented or not. The reasons I have for this comparison are numerous, and there are so, so many more games that could school Ubisoft on this, at the end of the day, not terribly novel system. State of Decay for team and base management, the Lord of the Rings games for procedurally generating long-term rivalries and manipulating enemy forces, any number of squad-based shooters for just simple squad mechanics, some of which Ubisoft had a hand in. 
the Legion system is a worthless mechanic. At best, it allows Ubisoft to dodge writing an unlikable protagonist and then winds up making a whole city of them. It's a trick to give the player authorship over a character so that there's some natural, easy, and hollow investment. The key thing I wanted to demonstrate is the sheer lack of imagination the system possesses. The moment you create a team mechanic that has no team mechanics, there is little point for it to exist. It doesn't bring anything new to the table, it just takes a chainsaw down the middle of it. Dividing features that already existed, then making sure none of them are ever necessary. Culling bits and pieces that it can't fully reconcile, like the weapon variety, the ability to call hits, hiding in cars for some reason is gone. It's an absolute worst case scenario, and it makes the selling point of the game its worst aspect, a weight around the less marketable but more structurally sound parts of the game. I'll end this discussion of the Legion system with this tidbit. In a piece for PC Games N, creative director Clint Hocking talks about the removal of dogs, putting it down to not knowing how to handle what should happen to it if its owner dies. Apparently segregating dogs from the system just wasn't on the cards, so they scrapped the whole thing. I bring this up because removing dogs from Watch Dogs Legion because it doesn't fit with the Legion system is such a perfect metaphor for this whole stupid exercise. This article is likely just a fluff piece to make press out of a feature being removed and get ahead of any potential criticism down the line, but it does make me want to remind everyone that when you remove a person from their car, they'll forget it exists. If we're going to be worried about mechanics not coming together, I'm surprised there's even a game for us to talk about. Anyway, now that we've saved London, let's save London! Ah, <sighs> nothing we've done so far has mattered. And yet this was the interesting part of the game. So, we're finally at the actual story. Well, stories. Legion chunks its narrative into faction-based chapters, as DedSec investigates various groups both to stop their schemes and unearth who amongst them is hosting the mysterious Zero Day. Each of these plots features somewhat distinct casts, tones, and to a small degree, gameplay priorities. It's better constructed than Watch Dogs 2 and not as bogged down as 1. I never felt like I was lost or that the story was spinning its wheels. Yet the quality of said story swings between vacuously dull and almost okay, once reaching the lofty heights of me leaning forward in my chair and going, ooh. I'm going to go through the story faction by faction and condense these down a lot. This isn't entirely accurate to how the game plays out, but it should hopefully make things simpler and let us talk about some broader topics along the way. Let's go. Our first target winds up being Clan Kelly. Under Albion's police state, organized crime consolidated under the leadership of Mary Kelly which means there's exactly two hostile factions in the game instead of Watch Dogs 2's miscellaneous gangs. It's another dull simplification likely made in service of the social stealth and its Legion connections. After Laura nicks some poorly guarded cutting edge surveillance tech, David puts it to use at the Tone bombing site. Discovering Clan Kelly's role in the bombing leads to Veer rescuing Caitlin Lau, a detective with the Met who wound up in their crosshairs. From here, Nina uncovers a conspiracy where in return for their assistance, Albion allowed Clan Kelly to use a clinic at an immigrant internment camp to quietly disappear people, implanting them with a poison secreting crisp. I mean chip. Before selling them to wealthy buyers. Mary Kelly's manor, meanwhile, is filled with slaves, who are brutally punished for any indiscretion. It ends when Caitlin Lau, up until this point an unwavering believer in returning the police to its former respectability, has breed on disabled chips and realized the futility of her own legal powers. Who are you protecting? The system or the people? Promise us. Promise us. She won't go free. She lets Kelly's victims take justice into their own hands as her and Billy watch. <laughs> Go. I'll take care of this. Well, tone fucking set. Mary Kelly is flat, but she's actually a sort of fun villain, despite how that all may sound. She's evil and she loves it. There's an appreciable lack of pretension that makes it pretty obvious we're not dealing with Zero Day while still keeping me on board for actually taking her down. Inversely, I'm sort of impressed. Watchdogs just did deportation centers, microchipping human beings, slavery and human trafficking rings, and it was done in time for tea. 
Right off the bat, Legion is a massive step up from 2 in mission variety. Linear segments, chases, SIRS investigations, different storyline here, but these climax with a really good set piece. Where we go under Albion's nose to investigate a crime scene they're in the process of covering up, which culminates the mechanic by merging it with an active encounter in a really engaging way. If you do side content, however, be ready for repetition. Storylines are padded out with minor objectives at the same old sites we've been hitting while recruiting and liberating, with the occasional break into something more unique to spice things up. Every story chapter spends over half its runtime doing vaguely rationalized busy work, and in the story alone many areas are repeated. It does still suffer from the same issue as the Burrow finales, in that many missions are just drone sections where you fly or platform your way through an environment so the game doesn't actually have to account for your operative. Which is very inspiring, really getting your mileage out of that feature. I can't fully complain because these are actually some of my favourite segments. Simplicity aside, they showcase so much more inventiveness than anything else. I particularly enjoyed this microdrone segment where we flew through some computer internals because at this point I was just thinking of Toy Commander and I enjoyed that game a lot more. Plus as all of this goes on, these are replaced by forced combat encounters that mean you better come locked and loaded. The amount of cutscenes that arm us with a pistol is also quite revealing. None of the times this handgun appeared did it belong to an operative who had one. It's just more evidence that the Legion part of Legion is in no way fought through. Another hilarious part of this is how chase set pieces and end of level missions fall apart, because your final goal is often just to get out. I've had times where an operative would die, the objective fail, and the mission succeed because, in a sense, we did escape. Rest now, friend. We'll finish your mission for you. Operative KIA. Apologies. Look at that. Your plan worked. The game just isn't built to deal with its own consequences, and it's very telling. We're also made aware of how Legion is going to tackle a key question. How do you tell a story without a protagonist? Simple. You offload all of the narrative to a series of more defined secondary characters, and you make the player a passive presence. We do things and we push buttons, but we're a ghost in the machine. Responsibility for the big decisions and dramatic moments go to marginally more fleshed out characters, while Bagley condescends us into action and Sabine… provides running commentary? This isn't entirely true. One plotline does acknowledge the player, and leaves me realising why they so often don't. The 404 chapter is an odd one. It's as if Ubisoft saw Gone Home and Soma and thought, yeah, we could do so much less. After following a lead and completing a test, Gilberto is contacted by Nout, head of 404, some other shadowy hacker group involved in leaking data and what have you. Nout wants us to investigate the reclusive tech mogul Sky Larson. David learns she's working on a project called Daybreak, which leads to Billy checking in on her manor home to unearth what she's doing. Just a bobby doing a little house call. We learn what Daybreak is. A neural mapping technology that either copies or uploads your consciousness to the cloud. A form of digital immortality. In what is a prolonged story moment that I did find oddly effective, we learn how Sky tested this tech on her dog before abusing her elderly mother's trust to get her into the machine. At first asking her nicely, rebuilding their childhood home to lull her into a false sense of security. As this fails and her mother begs to just be allowed to pass away naturally, Sky's kind front slips away. What should have been her mother's final moments are spent damning her daughter for betraying her trust. But unfortunately, those were far from her final moments. How? how? Oh my god. You just me. That's enough, mother. Sweetheart. Please, please, don't do this to your old mom. Let me die in peace. You never believed in me, mother. But you'll believe now. Day... Twelve? <laughs> Reserve the limbic code for now. Sky starts experimenting to see what she can do to a human brain defined by ones and zeros. I may just be easily affected by elder abuse, but the voice acting and pacing of information did get me invested in what was going on and genuinely disgusted at Sky Larson. Even if I feel we've stopped being watchdogs at this point, is that such a bad thing? After a series of missions, Breedon finds Sky on the brink of uploading herself. She begs us to allow her to continue her research uninhibited by mortality in the cloud, explaining that given the path the world is taking, what she's doing may be the only thing that can guarantee the continuity of the human race long term. The game then, for the second time in the series, gives us a choice.
I'm going to confess, the sickness at that earlier bit had sort of waned in the intervening busy work, and I left her alive if only because how much now truly hated Sky fascinated me, and I wanted to see her reaction. What's going on? What happened? Your mate gave Lance some fucking immortality. Pathetic. Sky was convincing. We're Flash and that dies, but virtual Flash, that's true immortality. Her work can help people. Isn't that supposed to be your fucking job? I can't help but think of those AI she created. Lobotomized, enslaved, shit. I get it. We're not on the same page. But we can still work with you. You can fuck right off. That's what you can do. A minute later, she apologizes and opens up her optional missions. Sorry for hanging up on you. Then a news report reveals that Broker Tech cancelled Daybreak, killing Sky anyway. So then, what does this choice mean? We're not primed beforehand to expect divergent story paths, and I'm more amazed than annoyed that my choice was rendered moot so quickly when I frankly didn't expect anything but the barest acknowledgement. The game just asked us, should we pursue eternal life if it comes from a bad place? An incredibly complex moral question, one which only the creative power of Ubisoft could so thoroughly sandpaper. It's fascinating enough that Watch Dogs has always pussyfooted around its central tenets of privacy and digital security, but Ubisoft is so committed to its own brand of spinelessness that it can't even take a stand on a pure hypothetical, a situation it engineered where there is as of yet no possible absolute wrong answer and only thought experiments, on an issue we likely won't have to deal with within our own sadly limited lifetimes. I know there is a real world analogue here. Is scientific advancement acceptable if it's achieved with human suffering? That's not what the game is quite asking though, is it? Just like with the ending of Watch Dogs 2, it realised something was a bit too lofty and might change the setting and ultimately decided to only pretend it was doing that, cutting and running at the final moment. Plus, consider this choice in RPG terms, where you're playing and building a character and maybe exploring their morality on your own. But I'm playing as Breedon Green, a random magician I found who, appropriately enough, hacks people's brains to make combat easier. I brought him here for a laugh, and now this one joke character is the most defined member of the Legion. Turns out he's pro-eternal life. Shame for him that permadeath's on. And on the way out, mistaking them for security, I accidentally punched an ethicist, which I consider the best bit of storytelling that happened here. So there you go. That's what happens when Ubisoft involves the player. It's a way to let the player speak so that we don't pick up on their silence. It's a dodge. Let's briefly touch on side stories. After you clear a mission path, a key character will roll up and give you extra missions, which tend to expand on and act as epilogues to these plot lines. I'm generally positive on these for at least digging a little deeper into what the main story suggested. Performing a crypto heist to screw over Clan Kelly, learning some of London's taxis are actually being controlled by an earlier victim of Sky and these cabs have been murdering former co-workers. This is undoubtedly the best plotline handicapped by being in a Ubisoft free roamer, human brain controlled murder taxis. One cool mission even has us trying to track down abandoned homes owned by a foreign dictator, which is actually a fun search. I will say it again for clarity, Legion has surprisingly imaginative mission variety. Then, we have some pure fucking garbage. He's fucking Stormzy. You know, bossy bop. Shut up. A celebrity cameo from grime artist Stormzy. It's wank. It's pure wank. I hate it. It's masturbatory. It's wank. Stormzy contacts DeadSec, saying that the SIRS have been censoring him. So he wants us to hack an IMAX for him. We're tricked into doing a very slow, very easy defense section while he blasts a music video in the background. All of this is framed as part of liberating London. The mission is designed to be easily winnable so you can watch the video, though I spent most of it blowing up civilians in frustration. I talked about celebrity cameos in 5. This is how it is for me on my home turf. They make me suspicious, they come off as artificial and dishonest. This isn't against Stormzy specifically. No one could have made this feel earnest. I think what annoys me most is this. Oh, we've set them off now. Don't let anything or anyone stop the broadcast from going out. This is the most concerned Bagley ever sounds. Just fuck off. And then something strange happens. The game gets good for a minute. 
After picking up a distress signal coming out of a coffee shop, Josh the cereal pisser goes to investigate. A flip phone, cuz. <laughs> what is this, 2003? It's a cryptophone. It's secure. It appears a rogue agent within SIRS wants DeadSec's help to stop a larger conspiracy. This gets us in contact with Malik just as soon as Albion have him rumble. And our rescue only makes things worse. You shouldn't have come here. I don't know for sure I've betrayed them. The fuck? We just saved you. No, you've just damned us both. We learn of another false flagging bomb plot meant for DedSec, and so we set off to dig deeper into the SIRS and their possible zero day connection. After some data theft and face to face meetings, we're told to get a high ranking agent's biometrics. And in order to get them, we'll have to go analog. So you'll have to get them the old fashioned way. Ah, torture. Christ, no. What the hell, Margaret? This leads into the first time the game has any fun with the Legion system, as Evan attempts to seduce Rose and strikes out. Yeah. Fuck you. It's a funny moment. I'm a little disappointed we don't have to puzzle out her type or anything. It'll just be the opposite sex of whatever you tried first. Which raises interesting questions that I'm sure console players with their 30 plus second load times can ponder. Malik is then able to put us onto the trail of our potential zero day. It's the head of SIRS and personal friend of his, Emily Child. We start trying to tail her and, well, the game actually got one over on me. This isn't my first day, Tom. I'm not in the car. She's onto us! Malik immediately goes into hiding and we scrape together the few leads we have left. And then it hits us again! Fuck, fuck, fuck! Don't move! Don't Hands move! Up. You send an operative into a trap and I love it. Though, something funny is that I saw a garage and I swapped to a getaway driver that I barely used. The first bloody thing Maxwell gets to do with DedSec, eh? Rotten luck. Dante pursues Emily, where she reveals that Malik has been playing them both. The man wanted a crackdown on DedSec that his superiors told him to drop, so he went under their noses and sold the plan to Albion, staging a fake arrest to earn our trust before weaponizing DedSec against his former co-workers, all in an effort to get the crackdown he wanted all along. Emily uses Maxwell against us, so now we're going to help her in her own plot, but then immediately lets him go before the big play, which is very nice of her. We're to meet Malik out in the open, where Child has snipers posted to take him out. But Malik predicted all of this too, and knowing where Child would observe, blows up the Canadian embassy and pins the blame on DedSec. So, this plotline gets a lot sillier as it goes on, but it's by far my favourite. There's some fun spy movie shenanigans and experimentation missing from everything else. Malik is an obvious snake, but he actually got me intrigued enough to read his data files, where it's broken down how he infiltrates DedSec. Him being obvious is actually maybe the point. He abuses their tech focus to hit them in their blind spot, getting to them through old fashioned face to face communication, abusing the player's own methods of recruitment and trust in people, actually turning a mechanic you've been engaging with into a story twist. It's only almost clever. There's a disconnect since how Malik does it only cinematically lines up with our mechanical methods. That tailing bit with the self-driving car genuinely caught me off guard. I was amazed the game used a part of the world I had grown blind to through exposure and tricked me up with it. For a group that are meant to be the underdogs, DedSec's constant victories do sort of destroy the tension. This chapter actually made me feel like we're on the ropes, showing that experienced government agents can run circles around DedSec while exploring the flaws in how the group functions and it gets us there by using its own features to mess with the player directly, making fools of us and the characters both, and it's great. This is where I leaned forward and went, ooh. So, you've got me. How do we get out of this one? Well, we hack a bigger thing. Bagley now has access to even more security because of the thing we hacked, and we capture Malik in five seconds. Shit. I feel like I just saw some fucking life in this format and it ends by flatlining. It's such a boring and trite conclusion to okay proceedings. I do have another complaint, which is just two gameplay sections that are monstrously dull. One is a wire puzzle twist where we have to defend Bagley from a horde of drones because we're not allowed to solve it. And I'm back. Do try to keep them off me this time. I can't hack into the safe house if you don't keep those drones off me. I can't hack into the safe house if you don't keep those drones off me. I still hold that resistance mode is the better way to play, but 
but they didn't think the whole lowered ammo count thing through. Then that final section where we hack filament and make Bagley of ill-defined power even more powerful is nightmarish. And I'm talking with the strongest operatives I could feel. Endless waves of drones and drones. Three defense points at the far ends of a big room. And enemies that will halt your countdown. Yeah, it's tons of fun. That aside, if the game toyed with its mechanics this much throughout, I would be praising Legion as a game that is firmly just above middling. Making sure it doesn't reach those dizzying heights is the primary antagonist, Albion PMC. I heard someone saying dead sec was bad. Yeah mate, we liberated all of fucking London before I got here. Remember that bit in the trailers where they touted the Players Anyone system by hyping up how you could sneak into an Albion base to eavesdrop on a meeting? Well, it's not so much that you can, it's more that you must. It's very heavily guarded, we can't get in there. It opens with a forced recruitment and social stealth segment. It's in this meeting Margit finds Nigel Cass, the game's worst villain. <laughs> and the main one. The moment he shot that guy, I could feel any investment I might muster just evaporating. It's a hackneyed move meant to make a villain look imposing, and in this case demonstrate that Nigel is above the law. But it also acts as shorthand for, the actions this guy takes will not make any sense. His backstory is as follows. He watched his dad die in a random crime. So now he's creating Project Themis. He wants to connect a life score algorithm to murder drones so they'll eliminate criminals before they commit crime. And he'll kill anyone who gets in his way. The police commissioner himself. Assassinated by terrorists. His whole shtick is that humanity is random and unpredictable so he only puts his trust in unfeeling machines, dressing up justice as something entirely calculable. We're missing the human element here. It's the human element that got us into this. I brought all of this up so I could break it down, but... I'm sorry, it's just your typical hackneyed villain shit. It vaguely alludes to a point about how we could abuse data, there is a far off applicability, but it's not going anywhere or really demonstrating anything by it. Albion has found a way to apply an existing system, LifeScore, a data aggregator of biometrics, personal information, to our new autonomous drones. Also a side note, but I find it odd how the story treats this predictive algorithm as an entirely new idea when it was a key element of the first game and the inciting incident of the second. Fuck me, I knew it! The life score algorithm. My algorithm. Not a major issue compared to everything else going on, but it strikes me as oddly forgetful. This at first seems like a sci-fi advancement of a series staple, the next step of early CTOS. But it isn't. They think it's new. Long story short, Ruth deletes some files, and Nigel's former protege Hamish says that it's over. It's at this point there's a several hour long interlude where I did all of those other stories. Then Cass comes back and just decides he's gonna do the murder drones again. Guess we didn't delete them hard enough. The Themis data we wiped at Titus. Any chance you remember enough to retro-engineer a more suitable upgrade? I'll do you one better. I can code a virus from the data itself. What the fuck, Bagley? Why the hell are you keeping that data? I asked him to. No sense in just flushing data. Never. Oh wow. I can't believe Sabine is zero day. I hope whoever I'm playing as acts surprised when that penny drops because I won't. Anyway, we shut down Themis harder this time. And I mean harder. This is a ball ache. This defense segment is likely a breeze on normal. I'm almost certain no Ubisoft employee has given it a resistance run. Limited ammo, instant death damage, set against unending waves from both sides of Tower Bridge and drones flying up the flanks. Yeah, rest in peace Sylvia, hands down my most effective unit. I tried as Dante, but look, once I lost ground, I was never getting it back. I lacked the damage to fight the tide. I ended up cheesing this section. The one time I felt clever, like I had gotten one over using the game's tech. I managed to just about smuggle a drone into the hacked catchment range and spend the next two and a half minutes shitting myself whenever it seemed like it would be spotted. Those were a long couple of minutes. Oh wait, hang on. We're on the Thames. It's Temmie on the Thames. Oh, that's cute. That's, uh. And soon after this, we finally destroy Nigel's credibility by getting a recording of him and Sabine talking. 
The ideal targets are the Toan Conference, Parliament, and King's College Hospital. So Cass, a paranoid man defined by his lust for control, security, and predictability, got as far as he did because he was willing to offer control of a major security infrastructure to someone he can't predict. In return for helping him with a bombing that he already had Clan Kelly's help with. Okay, look, I know there's a twist coming and that Cass is meant to be a hypocrite, but this is weak shit, isn't it? Making a villain mad as fuck so you don't actually have to try is a bit of a cop-out. Making a bad guy with a decipherable ideology doesn't mean that you, the writer, who is definitely listening to this, agree with that ideology. It just means you actually wrote a fucking character and tried to explore something. Now, that's not to say you can't make a compelling hypocrite. It's just to say that whoever put pen to paper for Cass didn't. We leak it, Cass goes mad, and I shit you not, locks himself up in the Tower of London with his loyalists to keep people out. Dante goes to confront him once and for all, and we're greeted by what is the final nail in Legion's permadeath coffin. What I faced down here genuinely surprised me. It took three games, but we finally arrive at a boss fight. We need to write some wires while hiding from gunfire and managing endless waves of reinforcement. This is incredibly difficult, and despite my praising Dante's strength earlier, he's not up to snuff. Ah. And yeah, the game just switches off the permadeath for this one. I get that this is a serious step up in difficulty and you've locked the player in here, but it just goes to show how fragile, non-committal, and ill-conceived the game as a whole is. On some level I'm glad there's a boss fight because it is something different, and in a way this is an okay combination of gameplay elements to build a fight around. But Legion is the game least equipped for this kind of encounter, to say nothing of Dante and his piddling deadsec guns. So it just gives up, opts me out of a feature and gives me infinite tries. And I can't swap operatives in here. Even in death, Dante must die. It's all another reminder that Legion has no idea what it's doing. Let's get this over with. Nigel becomes Iraq, and after a few stun grenades fired in abject terror that I would die and have to try all over again, he goes down. Still you all clamp down on this city. What follows is the flimsiest attempt at a death speech I've ever heard, and yes, despite using stun weapons, that man is dying. Death six fatal flaw. Your faith in people. You recruit all types, don't you, straight off the streets? Well, I used to have faith in people, too. I got a good man killed once. Luckily for me, and Ubisoft, he decides to die before he arrives at a point. Beyond maybe the reveal that he blames himself for his father's death, which would weaken the already tenuous rationale we've been presented with and sort of make his whole plan not even make sense to him, the one person who it probably should. I don't know. Bit weak. Bit shit. But he's dead now. The game's final chapter begins on an oddly somber note. DedSec throws a victory party and all the recruits I in any way liked had died besides Dante, who had also died. Not that you'd be celebrating with the team you made anyway. They're background objects you can't interact with while all the people you helped along the way give really shallow thanks. Lucky for us, the party is crashed by Zero Day, announcing that she's nicked all our data and we're losers. Nah, 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 nah. After a game of hunting, trying to unearth the truth, Dante hacks a van outside and we find Zero Day. What dastardly security could her Leia have? <laughs> oh, fuck. It's down here Margaret finds all the tech we nicked over the course of the game alongside footage of a meeting between Nige and Saab. But one of your dead sex squad, he stopped the parliament bomb. I was rather counting on that one, to be honest. Revealing he was always intending to portray Sabine, aka Zero Day, from the start. 
Which begs further questions of why let Sabine escape the initial purge? Why bring a paltry two troops into a bunker you no doubt know a big time hacker would have rigged with defenses? For a paranoid guy, you're not very paranoid. She's running. Get her. With nothing gained, Sabine simply restarted DeadSec and manipulated them into accessing filament for her, which is ridiculously embarrassing for several parties. And now, her plan has come to fruition. Impressed? While DeadSec runs around fixing bugs, I'm deleting the source code. It turns out, all along, we were being bamboozled! By a fucking Anprim! She wants control over the system to destroy the system. Wipe the slate clean and start again. No more technology. And now that DeadSec have served their purpose, we're free to die once more. Except not, because this is another one of those mulligan moments. Once outside, we can actually die again. All of DedSec is under attack, and Albion are onto us in force. Oh, thank god a car hit me. I despise Sabine's sudden change into being batshit bonkers the moment she reveals herself and her plot. Up until now, she's been shifty and detached, and considering her disconnect from society and wish to reset it, doesn't maintaining that characterization make more sense? Imagine this speech if she delivered it with some ice in her veins. But do you really think a chaos machine can fix London? Fix? Well, you think we can fix this? What, with crypto-anarchism? Protesting? Doxing? Optics are glorified cattle tags. Albion shoots civilians in broad daylight. Snitching is now a means of survival. No. You skids can't fix anything. Skids? I like to think of us as watchdogs. Whistleblowers and whatnot. Putting psychotics like you in their place so goodness can flourish. And you're the arbiter of goodness. <sighs> Let me ask. How many have you killed since DedSec restarted? It would still be awful. After all, she pulls the incredibly tired, you murder too, just as bad. Well, I'm sorry, Ubisoft, that you cheated me into this utterly specious moral impasse. Her plot to reset society, besides being nonsensical to the point of parody, is what the me who covered last game would label a thematic misunderstanding. It isn't. It's obfuscation. But it's not even good at it. Evil technology has been a common motif throughout the game. But wasn't the actual evil presented a police state caused by good old fashioned lies and the people with guns who believe those lies? This is where I look back and realize the technology bullshit has just been obscuring the actual things happening. Disappearing people from a detention center? Horrible. But ooh, evil microchips. Unethical human testing and abuse of consent? What if your mum ran on batteries? Actually fun spy thriller? Shitty watchdogs ending. Shogun authority over a city? Murder drones. The most common trick of Legion's story has been putting a real world problem in front of our face, then shifting it to sci-fi bullshit so we can focus on that and not have to show any real stance or extrapolate on the actual issue in any capacity. I'm gonna say something more daring than Watch Dogs ever has. A private military being in control of a city is a bad thing. That is the low bar Watch Dogs cannot meet. It's lower than you think, since it's not even a problem of a corrupt government. They've been shuffled out of the story. <laughs> it's a private military. So the note it ends on is, why not just break all the technology? Maybe because the game has been saying we'll fight the power, not make sure it doesn't get switched off. In summary, shit villain, bad ending, can't even dodge the question right. So Dante drops Sabine off a roof. I expect to see her next game. The final mission of Legion is one of the few times it tries in earnest to use multiple recruits. While Dante is out dropping Sabine, another needs to shut things down. The game picked Josh, and I found that too funny to pass up. Apparently Bagley is causing all technology in the city to go haywire. I hadn't picked up on this, but apparently Bagley is part of the city's operating system. We have a sort of separate one made to help us. The point is, the only way to stop this is to kill Bagley, and we make certain we are wiping him clean, overheating his core server to stop him from accessing backups while we destroy the source. And everyone acts really sad about this. 
we get an extended sequence of breaking into Bagley's core server and shutting him down, and it's framed as a friend willingly ending their life to save ours. Deactivating this container will be the same as the others. Nah, oh, bruv, it won't. Yes, you simply re- It won't be the same, Bags. I'll be ending you. It's what needs to be done. If you're worried about me, rest assured I was reprogrammed to serve DedSec and it serves you and London. Bagley is mourned and much is made of his sacrifice and I'm, I'm sorry, I could not bring myself for one moment to care about the condescending comedy robot whose dialogue was punched up by Yahtzee. And all the while, it falls on Josh to shoulder the emotional burden of the scene. May I stop this operation? Oh, come on, man. It's hard enough for me as it is. I have new thoughts. Where do AIs go when they die? Will I upload to a cloud? Perhaps I will see you again as a component in your motorized wheelchair when you are old and broke. Oh, my mum will love this. Dear God, my eyes. Don't think like that, man. All right? Don't think like that. Part of the problem is that this is actually a follow-on from Sky Larson's storyline, where the nature of Bagley's existence is momentarily confronted. Optionally. So even if you did see it, that was many hours ago and contained to that moment. Bagley has no humanizing scenes before or since. He doesn't ruminate on his existence, he doesn't even care to learn, and no one in DedSec ever probes him about this. So when we get here and everyone is putting on the waterworks, they feel even more artificial than the robot that we're gutting. We shut down Bagley, cut to black, credits roll. Credits end and Bagley is immediately alive again, yay, fuck all that effort and finality! And having instantly pissed away its first crack at an emotional moment actually related to the player, the game wastes no time in trying for a second. Deciding that we're now free of the plot and they don't actually have to worry about growth affecting the script, they're going to flesh out the comedy robot. This leads to Maxwell collecting memories from the human Bagley's life through a series of photo ops about London. Through these snippets we learn of Bradley, the gay epileptic rowing brother of Sky Larson with early onset dementia. Sky offers him a fake fix, only hoping to preserve his mind, not save it, and an ignorant Bradley with nothing left to lose takes the deal. And thus, we have Bagley. Maxwell then tracks down the real one. I'm sorry, Bagley. And now it's not what you're expecting. I have to talk to him. Cast me to the telly. Listen, you don't know me, but I know you. I've done a lot of searching, and I do think I know you. You were a rower. You loved and were loved. You liked strawberries. You had a sister you trusted, and she hurt you. And I'm sorry. You deserve better. But nothing Sky did to you changes who you are. You lived a life that I never could. You're a good person. And I am someone else. Words can't really get across my disdain for this moment. It's some of the worst, most presumptuous writing on display. It doesn't add anything to our understanding of Bagley, recontextualize past events, or even pay off a character arc. It's the emotional climax of something that didn't happen. It gives Bagley the post tense of depth. It's beyond cheap, it's disgusting. And that's how Legion decides to shut the fuck up. The writer, Dr. Samuel Johnson, once wrote that, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. For there is in London all that life can afford. But this game would tell you otherwise. When a man is tired of Legion, he is tired of tripe. For there is in Legion not a trace of life afforded. Once all is said and done, nothing really happens. Albion is still in charge, and Clan Kelly still runs the streets. We destroyed Mary and her trafficking ring, but of course they had as many side hustles as I have dead recruits. Brokertech, SIRS, and the myriad other companies connected to horrible human rights abuses and criminal activity, they're all still in operation. Maybe they lost their leaders and their image took a hit, but they'll still function and likely recover. In past videos, I somewhat naively railed on this. The events of Watch Dogs 1 didn't hurt Bloom's credibility, and all the companies we exposed in 2 are still going strong, they're present in this game. The ending of 2 even rewinded time so it didn't have to show us the fruits of our labour, even though we know now that those seeds never bore fruit. I have since wisened up to the fact that, yeah, that's how it goes. This isn't an unrealistic result of corporate wrongdoing. Not everyone's going to hear the news, and even if they do, what are they going to do with it? Companies have the resources and sway to weather a public relations snafu. They'll shuffle out a few people involved and get right back to business. Marcus and the gang were just as blindly optimistic. 
But where does that leave Watch Dogs? This series that presents the fantasy of resistance and changing the world, that praises the player's actions and tells you to have fun with it, but also won't let you affect change, suggesting that no matter how much darkness you bring into the light, all that will come are darker shadows. That's where this series is always going to be. This is the tightrope that it will walk as long as it's profitable. And this method of stretching a story out indefinitely and constantly baiting the hook doesn't deserve to be. The fantasy of change with the reality of stagnation. Conflicts never resolving because that signals an end. And that's just unrealistic. Both for the reality it apes, and for Ubisoft's fourth quarter. And well, if any company can speak to getting found out for doing horrible things and just keep on going, it's as they say, write what you know. I wish I could end on that note, I truly do, but I kept putting this game off and they kept putting more in. Legion's multiplayer is now a completely separate campaign from the single player, sectioned off with some of its own systems and gadgets. On a free roam London you do content to earn Ito and influence, renamed tech points that are now also spent on recruiting, with operative types now locked behind seasonal ranks. I haven't gotten far in it and the thought of doing so deeply depresses me. When I was playing the single player, the last thing I wanted was for this to be slower, grindier, and without end. The free roam is still where I had the most fun in Legion. Granted, it was only because I invited the two people I knew who owned the game to mess around with. Thanks to Mr. Cool Manist and writing on games for sparing the time, having a few laughs, and helping me get a few shots to spice things up. The thing I was most excited for in this regard was the return of Invasion, my favourite part of the last two Watch Dogs. If you think about it, the Players Anyone feature is a natural evolution from the NPC cloak this mode would put you in, and now existing in an online only mode removes the problem with pausing and giving the game away. Well, I managed to play a few rounds and it is still fun. The denser urban landscape of London does skew a lot more in the invader's favour, and I can't tell if the play area is larger or if it's just the architecture makes it feel that way. The only thing going in the victim's favour is that hacks seem to go much, much slower. This mode does have a new twist. Before the hack begins, the invader is allowed to body swap to match the locals, and it ups the paranoia considerably. It's a banging addition. What wasn't fun was that most of my time was spent waiting. Maybe one in ten attempts to get a match made it through. Sometimes I'd be joined to an empty lobby and immediately booted back to free roam. Sometimes even if I got through, my target would be so laggy I wouldn't be able to predict them. At one point the game just outright lied about my target being in a certain spot. Is it everyone opting out of an unpopular mode? Is it god-awful networking? Is it just that this game's multiplayer is already emptying out, doomed from the get-go by opening up months after the game's initial release, when it had at best a middling reception then? Based on the nightmares I had connecting to people I knew, it's probably an unhealthy mix of the three. Legion of the Dead is similarly empty. I had one full lobby. Once. For a main menu touted slice of gameplay, it is stunningly dull yet surprisingly unloved. It's a mode that's shamelessly trying to be addictive through the apparent excitement of randomized runs and equipment drops, but thankfully lacks the fun gameplay or sense of payoff to really get its hooks in. You're dropped into a borough of London and have far too long to sneak around the zombie hordes, grabbing power-ups and gathering supplies from hostile human zones before exfiltrating. It is slow, tedious, and insultingly easy. After I lost my full lobby and from then on could never find another player, I completed a run solo with far more supplies than that full lobby. They played slow and cautious, methodically picking off hordes and covering each other. With nothing to lose and bored out of my mind waiting, I just gunned it, and found the zombie threat was completely empty. So, that's Legion's multiplayer in brief. It presents a version of Hell, but when Hell has an exit, people will leave. Back to the single player, we have two last pieces of content to cover. The first is a crossover with Assassin's Creed. DeadSec and the Assassins. Did you ever imagine this happening? The amount of excitement not in that line is exactly what it deserves. If the actress actually tried to sell it, I would have been annoyed enough to quit there and then. The last thing I expected in Legion was an epilogue of sorts to Syndicate, the game this one refused to learn from. But here it is. Darcy's brother Lucas returned to the city to take the fight to the Templars like the assassins of old, thinking he and Darcy would be the modern day Fry twins and retake the city. He cocked it up immediately and is killed by Westerly. As this DLC doesn't have time to really make a villain, he's posh and has a moustache, and that does the heavy lifting. 
We help Darcy get into the tomb from the ending of Syndicate, where Legion gives us an Assassin's Creed style puzzle alongside, I shit you not, using Legion's controls, a platforming section. This DLC is 40 minutes long. More than half of it was spent slowly clambering around this giant labyrinthine space while hearing this stock sound effect over and over again. After we beat this level of crap bandicoot, Darcy gets her assassin gear and shoots Westerly. You want my advice? Find better people to fight with. But I need a brotherhood. Not to put anyone on the spot, but dead sex a brotherhood of sorts, isn't it? If you're willing to stand up for the city, we're happy to have you. Hmm. I'll take it under advisement. And by advisement, she means... pay. Legion has a built-in store where Ubisoft has been selling premium recruits. That mission there was a taster, the taste being hardtack, but that's hardly a bad choice when people really like Black Flag. Despite everything, I was somehow surprised by the sliminess of this. To end such a boring mission with a paywall was a slap in the face. There has to be at least enough self-awareness to know that putting premium, paid-for recruits in your Players Anyone game literally and metaphorically cheapens infinite other options. It shows an utter lack of faith in your own work and no respect for your customers. Well, that last part wasn't surprising. As bad as this will sound, I'm actually sort of annoyed that we're going to end on an okay note. It may surprise you to find out that the Bloodlines DLC is not just my favourite part of Legion, but of the entire franchise. I was equally thrown. If you've been around here for a minute, you know how I felt about Aiden Pierce. Well, even weirder, the fact that I can now do this is not what makes it the best Watch Dogs tent on offer. Least of all because you have to pay for Aiden twice, as I clearly did. Before I played Bloodlines, I decided to revisit the original and spend a few hours in Aiden's blood-drenched boots, spurred on by a vocal minority who have been saying over the years that Aiden was massively misunderstood as a character. When I look at the reasons people found to like him, they are varied. Some people see a genuinely sympathetic guy. Others see a subversion of the video game hero. Others see depth in his lack of depth. That's not a snipe, by the way. Others just think gravelly murder Batman is pretty cool. That one kind of is. I found him a boring drone, that the story wrote a check that his character couldn't cash, calling for a street smart social engineer when instead we got a violent lunatic. But between the fan club and a producer of Watch Dogs supporting the theory that Aiden is flipping the idea of a free roaming power fantasy, which, well, I can't prove wasn't intentional all along, I felt it only fair to give him another chance. So, I will admit, I was more than a little blind. Am I now converted to the cult of the fox? No. Is Aiden absolute dog shit? Also no. He is a much better written hypocrite than Nigel Cass at the very least. Somehow seeing scenes like this... I killed her. No, you didn't. I don't blame you. But promise me you will stop. And thinking they were mistakes rather than a very real acknowledgement that, no, Aiden knowingly lied and is in the wrong, he blames himself for the incident and can't let it go. For him, killing criminals isn't just vengeance, it's penance. As the game goes on, this only causes more pain and loss, so Aiden blames himself more, stuck in a feedback loop where the only path he sees to absolve himself is the one that got him here. He has tunnel vision, only seeing the world through the barrel of a gun. Here's the thing. We play as the fox, and the majority of the time, he's portrayed as a super cool manipulator who can get one over on anyone who's crossing him, exceptional in conflict, conversation, and computing. We are the mask that Aiden puts on, a thin veneer of justice and distance to fight the same criminal underworld that he excels in, the same world that made him. All the damage he does, he files away as righteous, but so does the game. We don't play as Aiden Pierce, we watch and listen to Aiden Pierce. And when the mask is down, this man is an awkward, barely contained wreck. He can hardly interact with normal people anymore. He'd much rather be out there getting into scrapes with us. Far more comfortable in a gunfight since at least there he can have an honest exchange. 
and it is undeniably interesting. Then come Clara and T-Bone, and these two ruin the dynamic. Clara because she genuinely sees something in and falls for Aiden, even when she already had the far more interesting motivation of guilt for her role in Lena's death keeping her around. And T-Bone, rather than just being a man of his word, gets genuinely chummy with Aiden, and in neither case does Aiden give them anything to like in return. If they were conduits for Aiden to reclaim some of his normalcy, I'd be much more positive. But Aiden doesn't grow, doesn't develop. And at the end when he says he'll now use what he's learned to fight crime forever, this isn't framed as a broken man embracing the hell he paid his way into. It's played as heroic self-actualization. He's free! Of all the people who ever cared about him. Is it that with nothing left to sacrifice, Aiden sacrifices himself for others? Is he doing it for himself? Or is he Batman with a gun and that's cool because Batman? Sometimes when depth is viewed from the wrong angle, it looks like clumsy writing, but the opposite is also true. And if someone likes or dislikes something, they'll work backwards to explain which way it is. That's not a condemnation, that's how I think most people come to understand media. Here's how it shakes out for me. Aiden winds up exactly as shallow as the puddle he free roams in. It's a character study fighting a losing battle for focus in a game that wants to sell his hat as iconic. The audience is positioned by the marketing and the game itself to see Aiden as a power fantasy, so when the game turns around and reveals it wants moral ambiguity, there's no real winning here, we just have a character of unclear purpose. When the producer praises a morally ambiguous read of Aiden Pierce, I don't see an earnest congratulations. I see Paul Marketing going, why yes, buy more Ubisoft games. Next year we'll have the same great writing you know and love. Lastly, none of this excuses him missing the whole Merlot connection unless you want to make the absurd stretch that he subconsciously ignored an obvious lead so he could continue his spree as long as possible and take down as many people as he could along the way. Even if you want to take that route, all you're doing is justifying hours worth of padding as a character trait. The reason I respect Bloodlines is that, keeping everything I just said in mind, it tackles Aiden's character about as honestly as it can. It feels like a story undertaken with less corporate oversight, plotted by people who are genuinely invested in figuring out what happens to someone like Aiden, who got to flex their creative muscles and have some fun along the way. It's the character study he needed. Far from perfect, but as good as we're going to get. We open with Aiden being woken from his slumber by a call from Geordi. Phones burn, make it quick. Uh, I'm like your one friend, Aiden. You should be nicer to me. Great, I'm hanging up now. Aiden is now a mythical figure, home and abroad. His last decade and a half spent fighting crime and toppling warlords all over the globe. And this is where it got him. Living out of his car underneath a bridge, always on the run. Geordi is offering Aiden a job he himself can't take. A gig in the recently locked down London, where Aiden's nephew Jackson is now a university student. Aiden decides to take the job and smuggle himself in, driven by an excuse to reconnect and promise of a payday that would set Jackson for life. We join him on a riverboat being snuck into the capital. I really do like the back and forth between Aiden and the captain since it does immediately humanize Aiden a little. We see him stealing his nerves, not for the job ahead but the possible reconciliation afterwards. His awkward and obviously sad smile to the captain should be creepy. I mean, it's Aiden smiling but it's fake in a way that makes it endearing. It's a mask, a pleasantry. When the smuggler informs him about the issue of his car, Aiden doesn't explode. His fiery mean streak isn't always on anymore, his capacity for it having burnt out long ago. He's now just weary and reserved with a hint of regret and vulnerability. He can actually act normal again, only turning on the anger when he needs to. Now, here's the rub. I just spent 90 hours in a loosely jumbled together mess of a game, where story was delivered by uncanny puppets spewing words at each other. 70 seconds of actual characters having an entirely sensible back and forth on screen, peppered with body language and emoting, blew my mind. I think this was a well put together scene, but was I so worn down that even the most basic things impressed me now? This thought took many forms in this playthrough. I kept comparing Bloodlines to the base game and realizing how much I missed an actually constructed experience. But Bloodlines isn't truly exceptional, except by Watchdog standards. The gameplay then begins with an actually fun sequence. 
while I don't appreciate another tutorial going over gameplay basics, I do appreciate a sense that things are building. Aiden is here to gather evidence of corporate malfeasance in a conflict between robotics company Rempart and AI-focused Brokatech. As he enters their deep labs, he finds he's moments behind a violent intruder. While he puts together who he may be up against, we also learn about Thomas Rempart and that he's more or less the reason we're in this mess. Man-child with a private army. Dangerous combination. Eventually, Aiden finds his smoking gun, the Broker Bridge, and it's as he goes to collect it we meet our second lead. Whoa, whoa, easy, easy. I, hey, I know you. This intro, once again, is an actually put together scene with pacing and discoveries and intrigue, spending time to set up a villain while also building excitement for Spanner and paying off that build up with an explosive finale. I can understand if you're not excited for Spanner, but it's the principle of the fact that something is being put together. Aiden's running after the guy, but Bloodlines is running circles around Legion. This isn't personal, just stop. Think for yourself. You stop. Not gonna happen. The chase ends with Spanner getting the best of Aiden in a fairly exciting cutscene. He's captured and brought before Rampart. Oh god, no. My people dug this out of your chest. Rampart may be the pettiest, stupidest, least lofty villain in the game. He's also the best and most believable. Speaking to a kind of nepotistic corporate greed, closer to a Grand Theft Auto villain than anything in the Watch Dogs mold. He's a kid with a big position at Daddy's company. He hasn't made anything for himself. Even his premier robot design, the Mark I, is Spanner's brainchild. And speaking of brains, the Mark II's that he's already been selling in bulk are said to be able to house a human consciousness. Only problem there? He needs that broker bridge to transfer the people into them. Otherwise, he's just gone and sold the world's biggest action figures. Sky wasn't just willing to hand it over, now Spanner has it and Rempart is 100% certain that Aiden is working with him. So either he gets that bridge or he's in for a long jail sentence. That's our villain's motivation. There's no grand societal goal behind it, just desperation and avarice from a petulant child. And Rempart carries it with an appropriately annoying confidence. He thinks he's moments from victory at every step since he has never really known what it is to lose. And all of this makes him great for playing off regretful old Aiden. You said your people looked into me. What did they find? That there are a lot of stories about the fearsome Aiden Pierce. Most people say that all the violence in Chicago is just a regular gang war. It got blamed on some boogeyman called the Fox. But having met you, I believe the myth. But what does any of this have to do with you walking in here and simply trusting me to honor our deal? Look at it this way. If even half of what you said is true, is crossing me really worth the risk? You know what? I agree. There's no angle in it. It lets Aiden play up his vigilante shtick, even as it falls on deaf ears, since Rempart is blinded by his own self-satisfaction. Against a real love-to-hate bad guy, Aiden is just the horse to bet on by default. He's just more likable. And to Aiden's credit... And even if I win, then your people go after my people. And on, and on, and on, and on. And I don't have much of that left in me. He does try to reason with the guy. He's done this dance before and he's smart enough not to want to do it again. At this point, it's Rempart's fault for not knowing better. That's not good. Better get him out of there. Spanner, despite just hearing Aiden say he'd hunt him down, lets the guy free as a show of goodwill. And a tired, injured Aiden, unable to call ahead, breaks into Jackson's apartment. Oh my god, a computer. I simply must. <laughs> Jax! Don't move! Look, I don't know who you think I am, but you better get out right now. Ah! <laughs> Shit. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? I have not seen you in what? 15 years? And then you want break into my place? This is not what I'm doing, Jax. I'm sorry. But you're in danger. No. Not this time. 
I mean, you gotta send a an email or, or, or a text, something. That is how you do this. Jax, I can't. I'm sorry, but I... <sighs> After all this time, the two are finally reunited. Jackson is every part the Pierce family man. He's incredibly strong, a multidisciplinary genius, and has the absolute worst fashion sense known to man. Still, he does join the club of pleasant surprises. I was okay with Jackson, though I do have two issues, both of which are likely a result of running time not giving certain ideas the room they need to breathe. First is that Jackson is incredibly quick to open up a dialogue with Aiden. He goes from his rightful rant at his distant, formerly crazed uncle to patiently trying to understand him after two conversations, with a middle bit where he goes, well, I'm gonna help you so you can get out of my life. And that doesn't at all bridge the two. That second conversation is pretty good though. When Aiden tries to justify himself to Jackson, Jackson calls him out for his unsolicited and volatile help. Are you serious, Aiden? I'm a PhD student at one of the best STEM schools in the world. Mom's doing great. We don't need the money. I don't always need a gun either. But when I do, I'm glad I have one. Aiden's reflexive response is a stock tough guy put on, which Jackson picks through perhaps a bit too sharply. On some level, this DLC is just saying it louder for the people who didn't fully grasp Aiden the first time, and I suppose I can't really knock it for doing that. Second is how he treats Aiden thereafter. He seems to harbor something of a fascination and awareness at what his uncle can do, and since he has resistant sympathies, he puts the two in contact, both to help Aiden track down Spanner, and in the hopes he'll help them out, even though he knows what form that help will likely take. He even at times casually encourages Aiden before a gig. I think your resistance friends might have some work for me. Good thinking. They should be able to help you get outfitted too. If any of this goes sideways, you're gonna want to make sure your equipment's up to snuff. But then he also harbors a complex resentment of not just Aiden and his violent streak, but people who treat him as cool or joke about his history. And he flips between this scene by scene. You and everyone put Aiden on a pedestal. He's either the coolest vigilante or he's the worst villain. It's weird. Because he's also my uncle that, frankly, kept putting me in danger and then just stopped showing up. Oh, okay. Most of the time, however, the script does zero in well on these two, and Jackson's attempts to understand Aiden are the perfect way to get Aiden to explain himself in a way that's not just blandly expository. It lets us see the difficulty he has in explaining himself. Okay, well, let's try one out. Oh god. Well, I've had a hard time remembering what things were like before it happened. Can't even remember what I was like. Aiden both hates what happened and blames himself but also wishes he became the man he is sooner, thinking that if he did, Lena would still be alive. Aiden is absolutely emotionally stuck. He's invented reason upon reason for staying the course, even though a logical part of him knows he has to stop. And that is compelling. There's more to it. Jackson is young and optimistic and getting into minor scrapes with Albion, and Aiden, both out of concern and weariness, tells him that the good guys have already lost. In a line I want to like, but it reeks of Ubisoft justifying those endless, unchanging sequels, Jackson responds that, Yeah, well, some fights are worth losing. Well, let's hope Ubisoft's court case goes that way, eh? It does show these two share a stubborn streak and moral outlook, even if Aiden's background and methods make the way he carries out good far more bleak. We get snippets from multiple characters that Aiden pushes everyone else out of the fight because he does want to shoulder the entire burden, even if it means selling it to others as a pointless crusade. For what it's worth, I spent my life fighting people like Rimpart. Doesn't work. This is how Aiden comes across a lot more well-realized. This DLC interrogates him every which way, and even when he can't really answer, the fact that he can't does give us something to chew on. I keep trying to retire. Never takes. On that note, have some comedy gold. I mean, it's hilarious by itself, 
this DLC spends so long cementing that the Fox persona ruined Aiden that he has to move on, but also has this heroic the bitch is back moment. When the fuck did Nikki get that, by the way? Did you have more than one of those fucking jackets at your sister's house, you fucking loser? Ah, uh, the duality of the pierces. So, Rampart is threatening to track down Jackson if Aiden can't return the broker bridge. So we're given a few leads to follow and people to help while Jackson hits the PCIE. Perfect excuse to pad out the runtime with side missions. So let's talk about playing Aiden as part of the Players Anyone system. There's two ways to look at it. This is either a clever way to show Aiden is way more capable than your average punter, or it goes to show just how much of a bad idea this whole thing was from the start, since playing as an almost full character was just inherently more enjoyable. Aiden has two gadgets, a switch to simultaneously hack everything around him, and a multi-drone that can run, fly, carry cargo, and turn into a turret. Through doing side missions, you unlock hacks and guns, giving good mechanical incentive to do those jobs and expand his arsenal. This is a much more rewarding feedback loop than the deluge of tech points. Aiden's unique ability is a timed reload in order to gain an extreme bonus to damage. The window is so wide he may as well just permanently hit harder. As such, enemies are way less spongy. None of this is enough to recapture the earlier game's amount of flow and control, but it does at least try to emulate it. They even remade or regathered Aiden's old set of animations and gave him some unique takedowns, which is a nice touch. The side quest arc begins with Aiden grabbing a list of buyers from a black market weapons dealer to find Spanner. What starts as a pretty standard operation is upset when halfway through an Albion raid throws things into chaos. I appreciated the surprise, and while not every mission had gameplay upsets, this sort of playfulness carried into a lot more of Bloodline. It meant I never got nearly as bored because the game had shown me it wasn't going to just rest on its laurels and might tip the scales at any moment. There are four side quest givers which all follow a somewhat similar free mission structure, narratively not mechanically. Aiden starts off sort of cold and mercenary but becomes sympathetic either to their cause or their situation and winds up doing them a freebie or checking in on their safety when things go wrong. My favourite wound up being the most laid back of the three, the black market wholesaler Freddy. She's light-hearted, jovial, and only buys into Aiden's tough guy act enough to tease and annoy him with it. It's working. Kelly's incoming. Awesome. Happy hunting, big shooter. Big shooter. It was so far removed from the gritty, misery-filled hellhole that was Watch Dogs 1's Chicago underbelly, but to see Aiden crawl out of that and wind up next to an Only Fools and Horses tribute bit... So, who should I be expecting? Uh... Clan Kelly? Surprise! What? You just had me rough them up. Yeah, but those guys were trying to steal my business. And these guys are trying to give me business. It's seems different. This is a bad plan. Of course it's a bad plan. I came up with it ten minutes ago. Was honestly more charming than it should have been. It didn't break Aiden's character, nor does Aiden break character. Freddy is also a criminal, but she's also not trying to take herself seriously 100% of the time. It's a job to her and she finds fun in it, at least when things are going her way. So when Aiden goes into vigilante mode, it just makes her take the piss out of him. In a light-hearted bantery way. Not an annoying meta, nah we get it guys, trust us, haha. <laughs> the piss take is grounded in the setting, and interacting with Freddy was maybe the first time in tens of hours I felt like I was in England dealing with English people. And these sub-stories are varied in play and plot. It fleshes out some side characters from the main campaign, which is an odd choice considering just how little these characters will wind up mattering. They're more or less actually created here to be corpses there. We meet Angel and help him deal with issues about the borough. While it's not an absolute ton, Angel's questline skews as close to showing real abuse of power as the entire game gets. False arrests on vulnerable people, minor crimes becoming execution worthy, and Angel is even nabbed and placed in the EPC where the system will forget him. Aiden in a panic goes to break him out, but Angel decides to stay and in the main game, by the time we find him he'll be dead thanks to a far stupider plot. We do a few jobs for a burgeoning, but as we know, unimportant pre-deadsec resistance for Connie, the barkeeper who will wind up hosting the new deadsec. While I found Freddy charming, it was with Connie that I got my one proper laugh from Bloodline, and it was the moment the absurdity of the situation was hitting me. He wants to revoke permanent residency status from anyone who got it under the EU. Of course, only the richest will be able to reapply. Thousands of London ah, Aiden, Fierce and Brexit together at last. <laughs> this is as close as Ubisoft dares to get to the political commentary it rode on for marketing. 
and we do some investigations for background character and podcaster Claire Waters. Aiden winds up caring enough about her and the work she does to give her some pro bono advice to defend herself. The main game will then show us that this did not help. It's sort of bleak. Connie survives, even if her importance doesn't, and Freddy makes it out to Cairo, so at least the best character survived. As for the side missions themselves, they are at the least varied. A weird comparison, but they reminded me a lot of the gimmicky missions you'd find in PS2 era free roamers. Energetic, but freewheeling. Light in their construction, but trying to get mileage out of each and every mechanic. Bringing it back to main game comparisons, while these have a lot less in the way of custom assets and overall production value, they're actually a lot less tacky and more impactful, since these have you doing assorted tasks about the open world, making that open world feel storied and intricate, adding dimensions to places that in the main game just wind up rote stealth arenas, purposeless except in what's implied about them by their design. After some snooping and wandering into a trap meant for Rempart, Jackson tracks Spanner down to Brixton. This unfortunately puts him on Rem's radar, and he's nabbed just as Aiden is closing in. Right. I've already found Wrench. I'll have it in 30 minutes. Good. Kill him, and I'll pay you a million dollars on top of giving Jackson back. I'll double it. Wait, who's Wrench? <clears throat> Get a call first. Hey, 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 come on, come on. We're on the same side here. Broker Bridge. Now. This scene creates a nice parallel between these two. Aiden was brought to this point because of pessimism, his grim worldview that he can't break away from. Spanner wound up here because Rempart played on his optimism, dragging him into a corporate world he spent his own game fighting. I know robots, but he knew business. He had this whole speech about space flight and human evolution and... and... I completely fucking fell for it. It chewed him up and spat him right back out. I say this now because when we get to Reggie, that won't turn out to be a running theme of Bloodline. This is the Aiden show, and Spanner's role feels more like Watch Dogs 2 fan service with a goofier character, rather than a fixer gig. A fix-up gig. But in this scene, we see cynicism and optimism go from clashing to intermingling with a nice callback. So what? We're all supposed to just give up? No, you shouldn't. Some fights are worth losing. It's as Aiden trades the bridge in return for Jackson, we learn Spanner is no fool. And a bit of a bastard. What follows is an escape sequence where Aiden tries for some... uncle advice. Triple. Low, Jackson. Stay low. Keep your target small. I got it. Center of gravity over your hips. Keep your footfalls quiet. Yeah. Maybe we can find you a helmet. Aiden, you are making me less calm. Right. You're doing great. I like this exchange. Strange as it is to see Aiden almost giddy to have Jackson in his world for a moment. After the first half talks about how pathetic he is, this moment seems to say that, actually, this is pretty badass. Let's talk about the new enemy this DLC brings, the Mark I robots. They've been here all bloodline long, threaded into certain encounters. They change the rhythm of cover shooting well, having abilities to force you to move and a health pool that challenges the player to pick between whittling down the human enemies or focus down the enemy which keeps flushing you out. They also present interesting questions in how you take them out. You can drain all of their health, but sustained damage will open them up to an instant finisher that may be worth risking even in the heat of a larger battle. It's a lot more thoughtful than most Watch Dogs enemies, presenting a complex series of questions both defense and offense oriented. It's nice to have that extra bit of consideration in combat. Spanner comes to throw up something into the works, giving the pierces a getaway. But it's on the way out that Aiden collapses from a mix of fatigue and injuries, falling into a coma. With going to a hospital off the cards, it's up to these two to stabilize him. Swapping to Spanner with his lower powered, all stun gun weapon set and far less powerful gadget does immediately contrast just how powerful Aiden is. Makes him seem as dangerous as people talk him up to be. That was kinda cool, and it let the gameplay reinforce the narrative, even if it's just through this almost artificial system where Aiden just has more raw damage output. Spanner is odd. As I mentioned, the game pivots to a more light-hearted, fan service -y mode, and I suppose that's just because there aren't quite as many ways for Spanner to develop. Ow. Or this. In Base Watch Dogs 2, he was defined by his mask. It stood for a persona that let him be the loud and boisterous person his shy self could never be. Bloodline instead treats the mask as trickery, saying that he's a genius playing a fool so others will underestimate him. 
Both of these may be true, they're not necessarily contradictory, and a decade and a half will change most people. But where Aiden is picked up where he was left off, Wrench needs in between story to give him something to do. He abandoned San Francisco DedSec, hit the big time, and then fell from grace, and is now ashamed to face his old friends because of a mix of guilt and shame. This makes it funny when in Wrench's relatively few and honestly dull to play side missions supplied by Geordi, culminates with Wrench reconnecting with Marcus after years spent not talking. You're gonna apologize to me later for making me worry about your stupid ass. The story will later have Jackson say, Harry, no. Dude, you play those voicemails from Marcus all the time. On speaker. Just call him back. Trust me. Unaware that that was resolved earlier. For me, someone who mostly liked Marcus, this just felt astonishingly hollow, since I got very little idea how the years in the world had changed him. I will give props to finding some of Spanner and Geordie's banter amusing, loathe as I am to say that. I like that it twists Aiden's arc with the people around him, while Aiden gradually reveals his more empathetic side and surprises people by showing that deep down, he really does care. These two start off enjoying each other's insanity, but the longer Geordie talks to Spanner, the more and more he hates him. Like, when you get a migraine. Oh, I've never had one of those. Really? Try talking to you sometime. The tone, intent, and ratio of content offered between the two leads couldn't be more skewed. While this DLC seems genuinely interested in Aiden, Spanner just feels like he's here because... Well, look, if nobody else will pretend Ubisoft's characters matter, Ubisoft themselves will try even if they can't always fool themselves. After some time, the story is solved when Sky Larson offers the two a way to stir Aiden from his coma. After clearing a hostile takeover of the Deep Labs, Aiden is hooked up to the real Broker Bridge. Turns out this thing doesn't only transfer people's consciousness, it also lets you directly interface with a person's mind. So, in what is the strangest, pulpiest, and hands down dumbest moment in the franchise, we literally go into Aiden's mind. And I shit you not, the PT hallway is in there. Holy, so it's, it's fucking PT, God. This is a sick joke, this is fucking... <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> I never expected the culmination of Aiden Pierce's arc would be Silent Hill, but who's gonna fucking stop them? Pardon the pun, but I'm of two minds about this. In the moment, I was completely taken out of the experience. That the emotional payoff is a wall-to-wall -wall video game reference had me laughing room by grimy room at the sheer audacity of it. Turns out Aiden doesn't really care about Lena. It was the cancellation of Silent Hills what pushed him over the edge. It's also the purpose of the scene I find issue with. The story had been doing a fine job patching up Aiden's character and making crystal clear what his problem is and why he struggles to resolve it. This section just screams it again before skipping the last few murky steps on the road to change. And when Jackson breaks the cycle of violence by getting into an unending line of Konami employees and returning Aiden's coat and jacket, he reveals the grave is meant for him. These long years have been spent waiting to die. So Jackson tells him, don't bury Aiden. Bury the fox. So he does it. He throws away his iconic cap, and Aiden is cured. If this was meant to be a genuinely emotional gesture, it is so far up its own ass. it tells us what route the Broker Bridge takes. If it's a stab at marketing, this is the deepest cut the series could ever take at its own self-important iconography. It's silly, it's absurd, it's an underhanded way to just shortcut character growth, to literally go into their brain and remove the bad part like a line of code. But reflecting on it afterwards, I love what this scene suggests about Bloodline's development. It feels sort of anarchic and free, filled with things its designers loved and could find any excuse to squeeze in and experiment with. It rendered a deadly serious part of the main game as absolute pulp sci-fi cheese. For a laugh. It has a human quality and charm that is thoroughly squeezed from every other Ubisoft game I've touched in recent years, including this one. Either that, or it's a sign these people would rather be doing anything else. Aiden awakes, a changed man. Good for him. Thanks. Now there's a creepy smile. And compared to that, the actual climax just can't compete for memorability. With Pierce Senior awake, Spanner wants to head off to face Rempart. Jackson says, just let the past go. Spanner says no. 
so Jackson says they'll help. It turns out the theme of the piece isn't so strict that we can't tiptoe around the lesson, as long as it isn't a revenge killing. Tell me, what are you gonna do to him when you catch up to him? Kill him? Yeah. Duh. Obviously. Is that what you really want, Reggie? Even if it's justified, killing him won't settle things the way you want it to. You want to lecture me about that? Really? You know, it's funny, because I could still picture Aiden making that speech before his brain scan. The only difference is I know he'd then go and do it himself, and right now, that wheelchair doesn't give him the option either way. We make it onto the barge Rempart is using to escape, and what follows is a decent combat arena. Lots of troops, lots of drones, and a healthy amount of robots tossed into the mix. It gives us plenty of room to manoeuvre and divide enemies up, and with Wrench's weaker arsenal it forces a lot of that mobility. It turns out being able to tune a challenge around a character can make for a better experience and a more gratifying thing to overcome. In the belly of the beast we find Rampart's own Mark II, a big robot boss. It's not great, but it's definitely better than the main game's finale. Unlike Cass's machine gun which forced hunkering down and darting cover to cover, this boss plays on similar principles to the robots. Its attacks are more meant to keep you mobile. There are also vehicles about the arena to add something to hack, injecting a little bit of unpredictability into the mix as well as more tools for the player to use. Lastly, we're not doing a goddamn line puzzle to progress the fight. We need to divide attention between fighting off hordes and stealing moments to whittle the boss down. This is a more fun combat rhythm that leans into Watch Dogs' limited strengths. Chaos, player expression through hacking, actually stealing an advantage. And this boss was no pushover. It took me a few tries, and unlike Cass, I couldn't just blame a bad choice of operative. I knew this was meant for Spanner, so I had to meet the challenge. No use. I can build another prototype. You have no way of stopping me. Oh, I've got one way. What follows is the ending equivalent of shrugging your shoulders. The moral lesson of Bloodline winds up being the rather novel, killing is wrong. And hey, been living that life. Not to sound blasé about it, but what solution does that leave us and Spanner with? This guy who holds great power and is seemingly unstoppable except by death. Well, we pull an epic prank and hand him over to Albion, which, considering Rampart's lack of presence in the main game, must have panned out well. The corrupt authoritarian security state system works. It's a weird note to end on, one that gives a very hackneyed and simplistic message that ignores what setting is delivering it, that ignores the forced murder of Nigel Cass and our casually dropping Sabine off a roof. What's next on the docket for you? Heading home? Nah, I think I might hang around London for a bit. Great. Looks like whatever trouble you get into, we'll have to fish you out of it. Aww, that's so sweet! What a nice family moment. We really do make the dream team, don't we? The three leads play each other out in a weird buddy cop sort of way, and Connie mentions that she'll need help with a dead set contact in the north. Which if either of our two leads do help with, their actions will lead to a lot of death and violence in the main campaign. Awesome. And they can be played in the main game. Yeah, I picked up a bloody season pass, please don't buy Ubisoft games to offset the things I do for footage. But Aiden and Wrench are fully implemented. The entire player portion of the script re-recorded for them. We were all naive once. But what's your excuse now? The police answer to Albion. There's no more doing this by the book. So, Aiden may have hung up his guns, but he'll take him down again for a little money. I told you I'm not doing that hired gun work anymore. Ah, you mercenary. Playing as Aiden in the main campaign is a surreal experience. Just like the system as a whole, the effort is commendable, but the result is confusing. He has to take on the bland, everyman qualities of DedSec. As such, many lines feel like they're being delivered with a gun to his head. They lack an honesty of character, and while they're undeniably better acted, that only serves to heighten the disconnect. I know this edition has pleased people, but I can't help but feel it not only throws Bloodline under the bus, 
but is incredibly awkward on its own merits. Welcome to the Resistance. The longer that Bloodlines went on, the lower my opinion got of it. Was it because of a genuine drop in charm as it went on, or was it a growing distance from Legion returning my standards to some baseline level? I do still think it's the best slice of Watch Dogs we got, a tightly wrapped character story which moves the technology to the background and focuses more on the human element. And that human element is key. It feels like something the people involved in genuinely wanted to make and had goals they wanted to hit. And I think that they at least got near the mark. And the shallow ending thereafter is just procedure. The problem is, owning it requires owning Legion, and I'm not sure I want to encourage that. I have a mantra to myself when making these videos, and that's that generally, no matter how bad I feel something is, someone might gleam something by playing it. Even if it's not necessarily enjoyment. But this is Ubisoft. They haven't developed in years. I feel like at this point, unless you're a weird analysis person like I am, the experience will not give you anything to walk away with that you hadn't years earlier. Free roamers are a simulation of reality, exaggerated and chopped down as they may be. It's an imitation of human societies and conflicts. The trick is in having a verisimilitude and intent that makes it feel, perhaps not real, but complete. You can buy into GTA, Just Cause, Boiling Point, Yakuza, Elite Dangerous, Mountain Blade, Kenshi, Sunset Overdrive, Infamous, it goes on and on. Because their gameplay, tones, and mechanics are additive and cooperating with each other to sell their version of the world. But the Ubisoft Free Roamer is a toy box, and has grown so shallow and purposeless that it is another step removed. An imitation of an imitation. The human experience distilled down into rigid checkboxes, unashamedly artificial. And in Legion, this extends to people. Humans. Without humanity. Bloodlines, by putting some humanity back in, puts Legion in sharp relief, showing what both the story and the game lacks. The fact it made me like Aiden Pierce on top of that is undeniably commendable since I can be a stubborn git. But if I gave number scores, which I don't trust, Legion, Bloodlines as a whole, they'd be knocking on the attic door of a seven, hoping in vain to be let up there. So, thanks for visiting my hometown. I hope you liked it. The real one is marginally less violent. If you want to support more tour guides like this one, please spread this video around. If you want to support me more directly, I have a Patreon with myriad bonuses. Thanks and access to a Patreon Discord go to everybody. Scripts and notes for those pledging $3, and Afterthought videos where I answer viewer questions about the game and test any potential queries are available at the $5 mark. We have another free roamer coming up next from a bygone era of sleaze and it will most probably definitely get demonetized, so look out for that.